Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a Black Sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Elizabeth Stevens. I'm Daphne Olive, and we are doing that crazy thing. Welcome to our roundtable. Uh, I would love to introduce our guest. First of all, the man whose fault this is, <laughs> Alistair in Stevens, way. in the best way. Hello, ladies. So great to have you, and thank you for this, because I got to say, it's super fun for me to get to talk to at one time all of the people that I just talk about black sales with constantly. Anyway. Well, I'm very but now Daphne in a podcast and putting all of this together because really this was just my desire to talk with Andrew and to talk with Lauren. So you kind of just done me a favor today and I'm grateful. Thank you. Well, you know what? Talking with Andrew and talking with Lauren is the best. <laughs> so I'm happy to give that to you. So let's let's not, let's not wait to introduce them andrew say hi to everyone hi i am in the unenviable position of the person who has to follow alistair <laughs> <laughs> oh we're really all just following alistair it's okay yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> all right lauren say hi lauren was with lauren was our last guest it's so fun to have you back so quickly lauren yeah it's so fun to be back i was gonna say in podcast world is my rap episode the most recent one that has played it is because we took a little break after that it's been actually over a month since we recorded that but for listeners it's been i guess maybe just a week since you listened to it so crazy yeah so it'll be a little over two weeks since they listened to it daphne olive you let a week go by without a new episode of fathoms deep i never thought i'd see the day i mean the show ending has slowed down your production schedule a little bit i suppose that's fair <laughs> right Yes, and listeners actually get used to this. We will be doing things a bit more sporadically sure. because after this, we are doing a bunch of interviews and, you know, we are now... At the mercy of the schedules of people who are actually super busy and professional and <laughs> yeah. exactly. celebrities. Are you implying that we are not yes. busy and professional? Oh, well, okay. Maybe, <laughs> and even the celebrity bit, you know what I'm wrong. Yes. <laughs> Liz is a celebrity. Um, <laughs> On Twitter only, but hell, it counts. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone gets their one little window. That's true. But Liz is my celebrity. Uh. So to some extent, you know, we, we, we're better at coordinating schedules. <laughs> but yes, we're going to do our best. We're just, we're going to have lots of fun episodes for you all for some period of time. Not a short period of time, but we can't promise that it'll be weekly. It'll be at, you know, hopefully no more than bi-weekly. <laughs> So tell us a little bit, Daphne, about what to expect from this episode. Okay. So um, basically, we <laughs> I asked everyone to give me topics mm -hmm. that they would like to cover, and we have many. We will cover some number of them in some fashion that will be some slightly chaotic. Fantastic. Right. So God only knows what to expect from this episode. A lot of black sales, a lot of smart people. And other than that, we make no promises. Pretty much, but okay. we're, it's going to be fun for us and hopefully for everyone else. Uh, <laughs> <Fantastic>. <laughs> so, basically, yeah, this is our self-indulgent episode. No, I feel like I feel like for me it is. That's fair. So, yeah, I'm pretending that I have all of you all in one room with me and yeah. not in various states and another country. Well, that's um, good. Yeah, I think my <laughs> self-indulgent episodes are the ones where I got to flirt with the actors. Those were real good for me. Just like <laughs> hanging out with Zach McGowan while he's showing me his sword. That felt pretty self-indulgent, but also this is cute. <laughs> okay, everyone else has their variation of self-indulgent. <laughs> You're clearly way classier and more intellectual than I am. I, I'm not sure that's true at all, but you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but um, okay, so yeah, but before we start with these topics, I really just wanted to recognize something. It was been a really interesting period since the finale. Mm. Uh, we have had so much more correspondence from yes. listeners than we ever had before, uh, which has been a blessing. It's really been lovely. Uh, we have some that you know, may turn into topics on the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, just really neat stuff. Just people from all walks of life who have interesting perspectives, either personal or professional. But what I really wanted to note was how the series finale really touched people. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not going to get into specific listeners right now or specific things, but I just felt like there was this really beautiful trend of people sending us uh, messages and emails of how that episode, but in particular Flint speech, what I keep calling the dragon speech, and I guess yes. I'm going to continue to call it that, how that touched people either personally, um, because it it spoke to them about ways that they themselves had 
it felt that they were um, relegated to shadows that had been created by someone else, and right. also people who who were from classes of people or groups or cultural groups or racial groups or oh. or gender groups or sexual orientation groups that that they felt very much like Flint that that society had done that that, mm-hmm. that the culture at large had done that to their group and it was really resonating with them about their own experience and the experience of their families of their peoples of their communities and it's just it's been really moving and it's been um it's been an honor um Absolutely. and so I wanted to say one that I appreciate all the listeners who have opened up to us about that and I also just really wanted to say something specifically about the Black Sales creators, um, aside from an amazing story and aside from a story that has incredible, you know, cultural, literary, you know, mythological things going on. It is a story that has touched so many people so deeply and, and even helped a lot of people go through processes of understanding their own experiences. And mm-hmm. so... I just wanted to say that at the beginning. It just yep. we haven't been on since since many of these emails came in. So that's it. I just wanted to start with that. Thank you, everyone. Um, this yeah, the show is a beautiful thing, and it's been a beautiful conversation for for everyone who has experienced it. Cheers to that. Yeah, I know that ended up sounding way more serious than I meant, but it, it has been a really big deal for it's me. Kind this. of a serious show. Yeah, and and yeah. I, I mean, I don't have to yeah. When you, you think this. about it, you know, it is kind of a real heavy. It's not a romp. Right. <laughs> well, sometimes it is a romp, too. And that's what's so beautiful is that it's it's all of that. It's the whole range of human experience. Yes. And, um, so, yeah. So I just wanted to, like, say that first because it's it's been a huge part of my last month, I guess, is experiencing that. So... Okay, so um, let's get on to our topics that all of you all submitted. And, um, and we're going to start with one of Lauren's. Uh, one of Lauren's topics was for everyone to tell us what their favorite season was and why. And Liz, I know you don't like that kind of thing. You, I actually am having a hard time with it myself. So you can say two. Uh-huh. And <laughs> you know, it's funny because I could pick two, except that I actually picked the number two, season two. Season two is okay. my favorite. I actually do have a favorite time that almost never happens. You're right. I don't like to pick favorites. However, season two. I was so astonished what happened uh, by how much the tone of the show and the texture and the shape of the show changed. And it was so personally affecting to me. It sh- I mean, it changed so much of my life. It precipitated my divorce. So thank you for that. And yeah, season two is is absolutely my favorite. Just astonishing work. I'll never forget it in my whole life. All right. Alistair. I think I have to go with season four. I think wow. that in so many Neat. ways, stories are defined by their endings. And I think mm-hmm. that we were all aware, I think, as we were moving into season four, that, that Black Sails was going to be made or broken by this final season. Yeah. It was either going to be enormously composed and literary, and I think we were all you know, fairly confident that it would be. But in the end, the degree to which the creators of Black Sails landed their story, the degree to which they actually concluded not just the the kind of internal narrative elements, but the overall shape of the story exceeded all of my expectations. I think season four is one of the most ambitious and remarkable things I have ever seen in any medium ever. It's extraordinary. So yeah, for me, season four. All right, Lauren, what's your answer to your own question? I'm also a season two person. Um, (laughs) um, Andrew mentioned before that the show is not really a romp and it's pretty serious. Uh, but season two, episode one, is the rompiest romp that yep. Black Sails has ever had. <laughs> so true. <laughs> that whole adventure with Silver and Flynn um, just automatically, I think it, that's by far the best season premiere um, of both mm-hmm. Black Sails and mm-hmm. arguably mm-hmm. most shows on television. Um, mm-hmm. And then as just as the season went through, I thought season two had the best combination of really delicate character study mixed with romp, mixed with interesting action, mixed with yeah. beautiful writing. Um, obviously, every season has that, but I just thought the way that season two put it all together. Well, also because season two is the one that made most people fall in love with the show. Yeah, right. there's a reason absolutely. for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes, that's true. All right, Andrew. I'm this. I did not expect it to be this varied. I'm a season three guy. Um, oh, this does this does not surprise me. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, maybe it's a, it's a byproduct of the fact that I haven't been exposed to as much good television, but. I think four, by the time four came along, I 
expected and knew that it would be as, you know, transcendent Mm -hmm. and kind of dense as it turned out to be. But for the first season, I thought the first season was fun. It was, was interesting. The second season really got a bit more ambitious, but the third season was where the writers and actors and cinematography started to say, the way you feel about this show is exactly how we want you to. Mm-hmm. That you are not reading too much into this. You're not reading between the lines. That the attention that you're giving, and I think Alistair, you spoke to it, it, it we're rising to meet the, the level of introspection and analysis that you're bringing to it. Mm-hmm. And I think I've said to you, Daphne, that moment when uh, Flint in the cage said, I don't have any lies left to tell myself. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that stood out to me as one of the most, you know, just vivid moments of a character's self-realization that I'd ever seen. Mm. And one of the only times where I watch a show and thought, I am right there beside you, uh, the character and all of the facade of the show fell away. Mm. And I think three is also where I saw a lot of the, maybe the second to last chapter is my favorite in the story because Sure. It sends everybody off to where they're going to land. But, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was also the guy watching the first one, loving it and hearing you say that the first two were the worst and then getting offended. Uh, not even knowing. <laughs> <laughs> Some caveat on all of that. Yeah, I think we did that to a lot of people when we were talking about the first few episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just our opinion. But well, well, they're also, they aren't as good. I mean, they're great, but they're, they aren't as good as the rest of it. Sure. I do. Ha- I do have to say that I love season three. Also, if I was going to be on the fence, it would be because right. of season three. So I agree with everything you said about it. It was extraordinary. Yeah, I think I am also. I mean, I I am told this is this is not like me usually to hedge, but yeah, I uh, uh, yeah, I'm between. I vacillate between season two and season three. I really do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny. The part of season two that makes me love it the most is actually the second half. Most people love it for the first half. For me, it's watching Silver go down that road of becoming becoming the invested person and yeah. ultimately the sacrifice. I, I'm, I mean, not don't get me wrong. The ba- Flint's backstory is phenomenal, and I think the first time I watched it, it blew me away more than anything I'd ever seen on television right. up mm. until that point. But. Silver's silver story is a quieter one, but for me, it, it really resonates um, in that part. But I think I think I do love season three more. Ultimately, mm-hmm. season three really just because I mean, people probably have noticed that. Like for me, a lot of it is about psychology and relationships sure. and stuff like that, and um, that stuff really just well and everything with the dream sequences and the specter mm-hmm. of death also stands out to me so much as a part of just yeah. the fabric of black sails that it's it's hard for me to pick anything else besides that I know. but again just because season two right. was so personally affecting to my life right. i have to pick it no no of course and yeah and i mean i think almost you know the last you know the season finale of season three is still my favorite episode of television, even mm-hmm. though season four is insane and the se- series finale is incredible. Yes. There's just something about the season finale of season three that just still manages to be my favorite episode of television. So I guess I kind of have to pick season three. Mm-hmm. Okay. I guess it's no one's Let's... favorite, but I do kind of want to speak in defense of season one, too, because... Yeah. No, I, season I'm, one is fantastic. Season one defender here. Season one is <laughs> this amazing thing of bringing in... A TV show. It, it starts as, a, you know, a, a prestige drama, certainly, but it's just, it feels in its first maybe two episodes like it's a fairly conventional TV show. Uh, yeah. High production value, well-written, well-acted, well-performed. I mean, it's it's good, but it's not great yet. But the arc through the first season, everything up to the first season finale is so completely extraordinary. The way that it gathers pace and momentum, yep. the way that it it builds to this this staggering climax, and the way that we are left on the hook into season two... I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen a show transform mm-hmm. like that, particularly within eight episodes. It's breathtaking. So I'm a big season one defender. <laughs> I, yeah. And I have to add to that, that I did, you know, I did do that thing that I threatened I was going to do was go back immediately after the end of season four and start mm-hmm. watching again. And as much as I even said back when we started Fathoms Deep, how much the ground is laid for the whole story mm. uh, from the first episode. Mm. Now, even more so. Like mm-hmm. everyone should go back and watch the first season after yeah. after experiencing the fourth season. It's a little shocking. 
that I haven't in done new, yet in I new really ways. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it blew me there. I've been tweeting about it. <laughs> eventually, <laughs> eventually, I will like make that thread be like I will tweet that as a whole thread so people can see it. But it's just like they, I've been tweeting the moments that in particular resonate with me after having season four. And mm-hmm. I've been doing that as a thread so that people can see them all. Uh, yeah, there are just some things that like took on a whole new meaning after season four. And again, you know, intentional, non-intentional, whether that was something they planned or not, it just, it is, it's just now it's reality. So it's amazing. And it's, yeah, just trust me, you all will see things you didn't see before. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. Okay. Next question. Going to be tough because we have so many things to cover. Okay. Next, we're going to Alistair's question, which I believe... I'm going to maybe have Alistair ask, which because I because uh, I want I want you to do the wording of this one. You mm-hmm. wanted to cu- you wanted to talk about protagonism, to whom the story belongs. Yeah, there was a lot of speculation throughout the run of Black Sails about who was in charge of the narrative, which of these characters was primarily driving the action. Because at the heart of every story, even something as sprawling and as ambitious as Black Sails, there is a simple set of opposed goals. A protagonist wants something, an antagonist wants something else, or or you know, the force of nature, which I think is what we have in in Black Sails, wants something else or somehow blocks the protagonist. Who is driving the action? of Black Cells, who is the central protagonist? And I think what is most interesting is that that question is up in the air. That question actually leans toward a solid and definitive answer for most of its run. And then the finale gives us a a definite answer. The finale tells us exactly who the protagonist is of Black Cells. Do you want to answer first, Alistair? I do. Go for it. The protagonist of Black Cells is Jack Rackham. He has to. <laughs> he is in control Just of the narrative. For, for the record, for the record, <laughs> Liz is shaking her head. <laughs> We've had some discussions about this. I can I tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I, I, I think obviously our inclination is towards Silver. Silver is in control of the, the narrative for most of the arc of the show. But the way that the finale in particular pivots toward Rackham, the way that the finale hands control not just of the narrative of Black Sails, but the myth of Black Sails to Jack Rackham and allows him to define it. He gets to look back at the story and say, no, this is what this story was. This is, in fact, what stories are. For me, Jack is the character who has the most human arc through all four seasons. He is the character who He is never, and we'll talk about this a little later, I guess, but he is never rendered mythological. He never becomes archetypal. He remains Jack Rackham. And that's that's not true of many of our core characters. And by ascending into myth the way that Flint does and the way that Silver does, even arguably descending into myth the way that Billy does, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of frees up that protagonistic space for Jack. I think that, and and going back and watching the first few episodes, he's so far in the back for maybe the first right. half of the first season, but he's still he's still making action. things happen. Yeah, he is choices in a way that the other characters don't really get to make. So, uh, while recognizing that this is an ensemble cast, and I would never say that Black Sails is simply Jack Rackham's story, right? I think he is the one who gives the narrative ultimately its shape. He's the one who who kind of defines the start and end points of Black Sails. All right. I, that is fascinating. Who would like to go next? I, I might I might I might personally bow out of this one because this is not I am this is not a way of talking about stories. I mean, I'm like familiar with it, especially mm-hmm. from you, Alistair, talking this way. <laughs> um, this is not this is not my point of expertise at all. It's kind um, of but, a structuralist approach. That, it that, is. Exactly. Well, right. It's, it's right. Part of my question about it, because I, I feel like there's a strong argument to be made about Jack Ragham being the narrator of Black Sails. Like the fact that mm-hmm. he ends, especially that he ends the season mm-hmm. finale as though he were telling the story of Flint and Silver and everything that happened and how Nassau got to where it is now, which makes right that was kind of my theory right theory that that he might actually be more than more than just the narrator Mm -hmm. in that moment right sure sure well and which i know nobody likes that that idea but me (laughs) proportions of how how the show did take on such a a mythic quality because it's a story being told so i like that but i don't know if that feels to me like an argument for him being the protagonist to me and i wouldn't i wouldn't even say silver i would say the protagonist for me, watching the show has been Flint, even when he took a back seat, so to speak, to Philver, who was usurped, to right. that it, it, he was still 
driving the action. People were just taking, were maybe enforcing their wills over his, and mm-hmm. he became a weaker character. Maybe, that's not what I want to say, not weaker, but but he had um, some, some of the power of driving the story taken from him. Mm-hmm. But I still, I don't think there was ever a moment where I didn't see it as well, being... I think Flint is a really interesting answer because the protagonist is defined by his or her goal. And Rackham and Flint have, I think, far and away, the clearest and most powerful goals throughout okay. the entire series. Rackham wants, you know, his personal fame, his personal success. Right. His is a personal story. Flint's is much more abstract. Flint wants, you know victory he well, wants yeah over the, civilization the, sure yeah he wants the frontier to be victorious well, over civilization and, well flint's you know, flint's goal also <laughs> flint's goal also changes based on his psychological health um but his hmm i'd say maybe his short term goal but i yes. think his long term goal right. persists throughout even okay. right up sure. to the or end the of the form, show the form of the goal yeah. like, that's yeah. right Okay. All right, Andrew, what do you do you have a do you have do you have thoughts on this? Oh, one? I want to hear Lauren cuz Lauren always sounds so smart. Okay, Lauren, <laughs> sounds smart now. You're, Plus, she's no so pressure. Cute. I'm not going to look at her. <laughs> well, I was going to say, just like the ending uh, where Jack says, a story is true, a story is untrue. It's like what you want to believe that survives. To me, the same thing that holds for the ending is what holds for the protagonist. It really depends on how you look at a protagonist mm-hmm. um, as the viewer. And I really appreciate how Black Sails puts that it lens in our hands to choose who the protagonist is. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's definitely an argument to be made, very clear one for Flint, very clear one for Jack, um, a clear one for Silver, although Silver is kind of a bizarre protagonist if you think about it, because we don't know his backstory, his goals have always changed, Mm -hmm. so by any Mm -hmm. conventional methods, these things are very odd for a protagonist. Mm -hmm. Um, He's very reactionary, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, But I feel like because the narrative kind of braids the historical elements with the treasure island elements, um, I think the strongest argument is for um, Flint and Silver as dual protagonists of the treasure island elements and Jack as the protagonist of the historical elements all kind of interacting together. I like that very much. Mm. I think you might even be able to refine that into an argument that it isn't either Flint or Silver. It's or, or it isn't James McGraw or silver that it is the flintness that it is this force of <laughs> that flint occupies for most of the, or, or, or is occupying flint for most of the run of the show and is then subsumed by silver around the time of you know the turn in the fourth season i think mm-hmm. that that might be what connects those two characters that they share this commonality because as as silver says in the finale you know he has taken flint into himself he has integrated flint And I think that one of the possible readings of the finale, and I expect that we'll talk about this later too, probably, is that one of the possible readings of the finale is that that Flint uh, that Silver has subsumed the Flintness and freed James McGraw from it. So Hmm. it's possible that that kind of you know dark and tormented force is partly protagonistic too. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So no one, no one's going to argue for Max, huh? Well, are you? (laughs) Well. I think Lauren I'm not actually. Good at, I'm not good at arguing this, but I mean, I feel <laughs> like, uh, you know, if we're going to argue for Jack, it almost seems like we need to argue for Max because often when Jack succeeds, he succeeds because Max is actually the force behind him. Sure. <laughs> I would argue that Max is relatively sidelined by the fourth season in a way that kind of speaks against her protagonism. But I think that Lauren was absolutely right that we are handed a lens by this show. You can watch this show and and believe that it is Eleanor's story. The show gives you material and it gives mm-hmm. you perspective and it gives you depth that you can follow Eleanor through the entire arc of the narrative. And that is a complete and whole story. And this is one of the ways in which Black Sails com- completely exceeds all expectation. You can follow Billy. You could follow Dufresne for all that you want to. You can follow each of but, these characters. Why? And see a complete, oh, why? 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 Oh, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, what you're saying there is it's a compliment to the show that usually a protagonist is the character who is most focused on, mm-hmm. but in this show, everyone is given enough meat to their character that you could make an argument for everyone. I think you could make an argument for Max just because she speaks to that. We're at our least rational when we're our most vulnerable. She mm-hmm. kind of internalizes that in a way that makes her a very strong central figure. I like the idea of making black sails like, like twin peaks where Flint is the evil all men do, yes. you know, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> Flint is Bob. Um, but no, I, I, I think that, 
what, what you said, Alistair, that's fascinating to me because it's almost saying that Jack is the protagonist of Black Sails, but I don't know if he would think he's the main character of that story he told. Mm. Like, because everything kind of, huh. I mean, he does, he is the person who wants to go for the gold and kind of kicks this whole thing off in the first season. Then the second season, he allies with Max, then he funds the resistance in Nassau, and then he brokers a deal for it. So in, in, a, in a plot structure, I, like this story doesn't happen without Jack in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it kind of doesn't end without him either, but uh, I don't, it's, it kind of, this is the problem and damn you creators and writers of the show. If this was a lesser show, <laughs> the easy answer is it's silver because you kind of see him first. Yeah. Right. Uh, oh. And then, and then you never stray from that. Um, and if this was a, a typical genre adventure, it would be Flint because, you know, he kind of fits the bill as the guy yeah. at the front of the ship with the sword. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think it, it comes down to no character got more than any other, or at least you could make that argument. So I don't know. It's kind of beautiful. It's 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 a single story, but it feels like there is more to this story than there is, mm-hmm. just because of how many different ways and interpretations there are. It feels like this should be a book series, you know, or or a a, a, a touchstone like you know pirate adventures. You could take as much out of that as you can out of Black Sails. I'm gonna say it's Anne. Uh, just because she was the, she's like the Mad Max figure. Like she's the constant, and then all of this nonsense happens around her. <laughs> <laughs> that you know, they're kind of like tableaus or episodes that she's at the center of. Huh. Okay, that actually segues pretty well into the next question I wanted to ask. Interesting. Okay. It's almost uh, as if we were professional podcasters. It's almost as if, and I don't, yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm saying that. I don't know if that's true, but uh, <laughs> the segue is to how the next question works in my mind. So, you know, really, I don't know if that makes me a great podcaster or just really just living in my own head. Um, so this one is my question, I think. Oh, no, I think I took one of mine and one of Alistair's and like smashed them together into one question. Uh, the question is, which characters fulfilled their personal potential and which ones worked against their personal potential in the span of their four season arcs? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, oh, right. And what aspects of their ch- personalities or choices led them down, whichever, like what made them either fulfill their personal potential or work against their personal potential? You know, each person can tell me ones that they mm-hmm. feel like really did that thing or didn't do that thing. I think for me, the hardest breaking point in the entire story for for any individual character is Billy. Yeah. Billy is our cinnamon roll for the first three (laughs) seasons, basically. And then the break, the number of times when I was live tweeting Black Sails where I would simply hashtag, God damn it, Billy. (laughs) Yeah. I've lost count. I've lost mm-hmm. count. He is a character that is absolutely broken by the desire for vengeance, his inability to see the big picture, his inability to control the narrative that he himself has played a part in creating. Billy is perhaps, well, okay, this is a story with Flint, so definitely not the most tragic character, but outside right, yeah. of Flint, maybe the most tragic character in this entire story. I'd agree. He is rendered yeah. monstrous almost mm-hmm. by oh, the events. Not ignorance. almost. <laughs> or, or, right, sure. Uh, Depending right, on right, your yeah. existing sympathy for Billy, yeah, he's he's rendered monstrous by the events of the fourth season, and and that's such a surprising character turn for him. Yeah. A little less surprising if you know the source material, I guess, but still astonishing to see. Uh, so for me, Billy is a character who never lived up to his potential. He should have been magnificent. He mm-hmm. should have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, a healer of, of fractured communities. He should have been yeah. able to play the Gates role. Yes. that was what he yeah. was, you know, bred yeah. for. And he yep. falters because he can't see past his personal desire for vengeance. Mm-hmm. All right. And who do you see as the person who most fulfilled their personal potential? <laughs> most fulfilled is really interesting. I might go with Jack, honestly. Jack wow. has framed... Uh, there are many characters who have. Silver is obviously, I think, one of the standout candidates there. But Oh, that's interesting. Jack- <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I think Not sure I agree about that. Yes, that's fair. Uh, <laughs> Jack, right at the beginning of the series frames a narrative he frames a version of events he says this is what pirates are and over the course of the four seasons he grows into that he becomes a legend himself after standing in the shadow of so many legends yeah i find that completely inspiring and and of course it's tough to talk about jack without talking about toby schmitz's fantastic i mean Mm, peerless performance 
So there is a certain amount of personal chemistry attached to that too. But I think Jack is a gorgeously written character who absolutely ascends to his potential. All right. I'm going to shake up the order a little bit. Uh, Who would like to go next? Lauren, you go next. Elizabeth, we will get to you. (laughs) Thanks. No, I just like how you said that. I'm going to shake up the order. And who wants to go next? I'm deciding. Lauren's you. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Okay. We're... Daffy I, runs I, a tight ship. I'm just I saying. don't actually. No, I'm like kind that. of a flizz is that next. I'm trying nope, to do it, kidding. but I have all this remorse and you then I'm like really uncomfortable with the role. You like Daphne and then choose when to <laughs> obey her. <laughs> That's exactly right. Oh my God. I'm the flint of the round table. Andrew and I both just compared me to flint. Oh, okay. I mean, is anyone okay, surprised? The- yeah, that's the next question. <laughs> Who are all of you in this round table? Right. Is this table really round? Is it though? <laughs> <laughs> this table needs a king. Okay. Yeah, that's oh my goodness. <laughs> Thanks, guys. You're so welcome. <laughs> what is my tragic flaw? Let's not go down that road. Okay, Lauren. <laughs> hey. All right. So who most has all their potential? Um mm-hmm. The obvious answer is Charles Vane, but since I've already spoken and written extensively about that. Oh, yeah. No, no, that d- no, 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 yeah. no. You are in Fathom's Deep World now. The fact that you wrote about it was in Inverse World. You get it's to true. say that here. But no, but I think I actually spoke extensively about that on one of my previous wraps, too. So I'm going to actually go Fair. with Miranda because I haven't gotten to talk about her that much. Nice. Oh, okay. Wow. So I feel like season four introduces this um, uh, interesting idea of whether one can live outside of society with someone they love and still feel happy mm-hmm. and fulfilled. Um, and even though this obviously was introduced in season four, I think it very much applies to seasons one and two. Um, Absolutely. And when we meet Miranda, she is living a life like this. She is removed from society. She's living with James, who she loves in a very complicated way. And she's clearly very unfulfilled. Um, she's not we saw having that her- sex. It was terrible. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> well, okay, but we do have to argue. We do have to argue that she wasn't really living with her with him because he just kept leaving her all the time. There is that as well. Well, but he is I the guess- presence in the house. He's the one who was with her even in absence. Ooh. Yes. Fair, but I don't think that really. I don't think that's the ideal everyone was talking about in season four. Like, hey, can I live with my loved one, but actually not really have them there? And when they're there, they're really angry all the time. <laughs> hey, although. <laughs> Was hey, it was it episode yeah. two or three where she said that even him beaten and bloodied and unconscious was him there with her? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah true. that's true. When I mean, he was about to leave her and leave her and leave Richard Guthrie with her. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's episode three. Bad trade. <laughs> yeah, th- thanks. Thanks. I guess. I get a Guthrie on my own. Fantastic. Do I have to walk him? <laughs> Everyone wants their own Guthrie. <laughs> that's but- absolutely not true, Daphne. <laughs> I know, I was joking. <laughs> but uh, th- their circumstance of living together is the closest the show has presented us with, an, with that image, because nobody else has actually sure. had that. Right, um, right. So and, sad. <laughs> <laughs> and Miranda, I, I think it, it makes it very clear, she wasn't meant to be removed from society. She's kind of a firebrand. Right. She's a mover and a shaker. Um, and yes, although her absolutely. death is very tragic, when she dies, she has recently reconciled with James and they've decided they'll start, she'll be more involved in his life and his decision making. And she's kind of at peace with that. Um, and she stands up to Ash. Um, so even though her death is tragic and she's cut down really before her time, she manages to kind of integrate her firebrand personality with her being happy with James' personality. So I think that's mm-hmm. why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And her connection and her empathy she shows to uh, Abigail as well, mm-hmm. I think, was really big for her. Yeah, I yeah, agree. Season one Ooh. showed her uh, Flint looking through that window of her with the children. Clearly, yes. mm-hmm. relationships are very important to her. So she's able to she's able to have kind of all these disparate aspects of her life that are very fulfilling to her before she dies. Yeah, I, like that. Yeah. I agree. And that I, that moment always stuck with me. The her sitting watching uh, James and Thomas kiss and kind of averting her eyes, which you pointed out, mm-hmm. which is a very passive. Uh, she, we we found out that she knew where this could lead. And was passive in letting it happen. And then in a different room, in a different table with that same clock, uh, seeing Flint, right, and and Ash approach each other Mm -hmm. and go to touch again. And that was her being, you know, what you said, Lauren, it was, nope, you know, this is the time I have become a different person. I'm no longer the passive. Uh, She became active and it ended up helping everyone around her. Mm -hmm. I think it was kind of what I would Mm -hmm. take away from. That whole I like that. Flint I like thing. that. Yep. So I like that that's, idea. That's really neat. 
Um, I can give you mine. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say that the, I think Billy is interesting because I don't think he knew what he wanted. I think even at the end of it, I don't know what his long-term goal was. Mm -hmm. Like um, Silver and Flynn, you kind of come around to that. And Billy, his, his, he made his goal opposing Flint, Um, (laughs) which, which is kind of obviously a very transitory idea because at any point I stopped to think, well, what are you fighting for, Billy? And I never really knew. And I don't think he knew. So I think that kind of hampered what he could become. I will say a controversial thing uh, and say that I think the person who became the utmost of their potential was Flint by the end of the story because I think he was a very good leader mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go- going into the end of it. I think that he had integrated um, who he was and how he saw the world you know, as Miranda said, as it is, right? Not as right. romanticized, but internalized Thomas's view of how the world ought to be. And by the end of it, had it was it was able to see things tactically, acknowledge that things could be better, but view the whole thing with the kind of somber reservation that Miranda had. Mm. Mm-hmm. which I don't think was weakness. It was just kind of peace with mm-hmm. that. Yep. Um, and what made it so sad was nobody who would recognize that was a left, left alive to see it. Um, yeah. You know, he's standing opposite silver. And I think I said to you, Daphne, he's become the Miranda mm-hmm. um, in the group and has become a Thomas to Marty. I It just, it's by the end of the show. I think that's what made it so tragic is that the Flint, that is in that final scene, you know, with, with silver in the woods is James McGraw as the best version of who he could mm-hmm. have turned out to be. Um, yeah. No, I totally agree with you. Yeah. And then agree agree with you. <laughs> right. One, one way or another, we, we don't need to go down that road right yeah, now. Maybe, oh. <laughs> maybe that was the price of admission. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, it's funny. I, I have, can I do, I, I can do whatever I want, right? Because we just declared <laughs> me king of the round table. <laughs> <laughs> um, I completely agree with you, Andrew. I think that the more distance I have from the series finale, the more I think not only, I kind of went into it saying, wow, that speech was actually the complete integration of Flint and McGraw. And I think you're right, though. And maybe it was me being influenced by stuff you told me. Um, But I feel like, in a way, the other cool integration is the power threesome. Thank you, Alistair, for giving me that a long time ago. (laughs) Is it maybe it's like a power foursome because he managed to integrate his own duality, Mm -hmm. you know, these Mm -hmm. two opposing forces, but also integrate Miranda and Thomas as well. Like he managed... Mm -hmm. That he, he that he may not be his bet his James's best self, but he may be res- he may be representing humanity's best self in that moment. Wow! Right, exactly. Huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I and I think this goes back also to the thing I said in the beginning is just how much he has touched people mm-hmm. with that speech. I think that. Again, what he might be trying to do is not the most practical thing, Mm -hmm. but it might be the most human expression of humanity that that was a bad sentence. But you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) I think I think he might have integrated everyone to some extent. Mm. Interesting. So, Andrew, did I just steal your idea in a way? Sorry. Riffing off of Andrew? Riffing there, off. Yeah, teamwork. Yeah. We, we integrated <laughs> our opinions there. Um, I have another person, though. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's Anne. For me, it's Anne. I mean, up until that moment, it had been Anne. Um, I think that Anne was the possibly the, like, the quietest transformation that happened. Uh, or maybe Max is the quietest mm-hmm. transformation. I also have a lot to say about Max becoming her best self, and I do think she does. That's for another episode. <laughs> or maybe it'll just be me. I don't know. I mean, no, I'll just I like, talk about Max. I will come talk, uh, okay. talk about Max yeah. with you yeah. for Max, as long as you Max, like. Max, yeah. that, that's my other self-indulgence is that <laughs> there will be a Max episode. Um, but <laughs> D, I just said it on air. It's happening. Um, <laughs> so, but Anne, I mean, for me, it was, 
I mean, I think I said this in the wrap. I maybe have said this multiple times, but it's such a huge thing that Anne had the biggest break Mm -hmm. or breakdown of her personality and of knowing herself and then became the person who knew herself. Mm -hmm. She needed a little booster. She needed a little booster about herself in relation to the other rest of the world or Max from Adele. But the fact that Anne was the one who said to Jack early in season four, like, I don't need to, I don't need to figure out who I am. Mm -hmm. Like, for Anne, of all people, who like is the one person who had who gained the level of introspection to understand that she had no idea who she was, mm-hmm. to then reach that point where she could say that so easily, not as a triumph, just as a like, get your shit together, because like, I clearly have mine, and yeah. I believe her. Mm-hmm. She gets the most haunting line, I think, in the entire show, which was uh, maybe it was something I was supposed to get strong enough to find my own way out of. Yes. Um, Which is an an idea that troubles me and hasn't stopped Mm -hmm. troubling me. So thanks, Anne. (laughs) (laughs) Well, also, as fun as the fuck you jacks are, they totally stopped Mm -hmm. in season four. They were so much more prevalent in earlier seasons. And it's kind of like how you guys were always talking about Eleanor's cursing and how that uh, was directly related to what face she wanted to put onto the world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think it's very significant that the fuck you Jacks went away in favor of these very thoughtful pep talks to Jack in season right, four. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right, and a lot of, I mean, that's the amazing thing. I mean, this is a topic I want to bring up in a little bit about people who are introspective and people who are not. Like, you could argue that Anne might have been the least introspective person in season one of all of the characters. Yeah. Because, you know, not like Silver, who's just refusing to be introspective, but like actually not introspective. Sure. I know Hannah talked a lot about Eleanor not being introspective, and I agree with that too. But I think Anne might have been the most, I mean, just so like, I will not be introspective. Um, and so then she had this for least introspective character in the first season. Of Black <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's true. Um, but I, I'm going to say that I think it was Anne, and I think she went through this process, and and during her breakdown, she was forced to just she just was overwhelmed with just mm-hmm. a piling mm-hmm. on of sudden introspection, and then she came out the other side of it. Like she came out of that in my eyes, really healthy. Sure. And her relationship with her crew was uh, was was kind of the external symbol of that, like that nobody respected her in the beginning. And then, Lauren, what you brought up in the series finale and probably other places is that Anne is the one who gives the last command. Like she yes, goes is. from mm-hmm. so yeah. so that so that her relationship with her crew is kind of the is is an external way of seeing how, like her internal health. I don't know if she ever left the present either. She might be the only character that, yeah, you know, it was very like in a complimentary way, like a dog lives in the moment, lives mm-hmm. for the moment. It doesn't concern itself with whether, you know, its own sentience or existence or purpose. Um, and I like that in a, even in a show where uh, looking ahead, show me my future here in this room, you know, mm-hmm. that's kind of value that the character who was most against that and most valued the present moment was not made a chump mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. the story. Um, they that's were made strong in their own way. Right. Because yeah. she was truly doing that. She wasn't deciding yeah. to do it. Like it wasn't. Sorry, I'm just going to keep. I, lo- I love you, Silver, but I am going to yeah. keep the rest of in here. Not like Silver, who ref- who is choosing to refuse to. Yeah. look back or look forward or whatever it is that he was refusing to do but it because it was her essence because she was being true to herself not because she was not not because she was negating what her inner truth is i think that's very fair i think that silver's presence his his you know focus on the moment is in some ways inauthentic because it's always part of this continuing narrative of his characters who live in the present, characters who are, are focused at this moment in time are those characters who have, in some sense, reached fulfillment, who have reached uh, a complete integration with their own selves. And as I've said before, the last time I was on Fathoms Deep, in fact, I think that that those characters die is the thing about yeah. the Hexales. sales. And yeah. very nearly and indeed metaphorically right. dies. Sure. Charles yes. Vane is completely inhabiting his last moment. 
yeah. when he is there because he knows that that is the moment that will define him both in actuality and in legend and he dies arguably gates back in the first season is mm -hmm. present in that oh. moment this is his moment he's mm -hmm. right there and he dies he stands up too. to flint Yep. The characters who endure, the characters who are not integrated with themselves, are the ones who are pulled away from the present. They are those characters who either have their eyes on the future or the past, or both in the case of a character like Flint. Right. Although I'm going to argue, and this you know, might be part of my ever-evolving theory about Max, I think that Max also reaches that and doesn't die, and I think that's very yeah. meaningful. I think that the fact that Max reaches her best self mm -hmm. Um, and goes through her process and gets rid of and and d walks turns away from her demons and yet still gets the prize. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is actually part oh, of yeah. that. It sh that that goes back to my whole idea of her being some sort of key, some sort of mm -hmm. some sort of central place in the kind of worldview of the show mm -hmm. about where all of these people stand in terms of I don't know their world our world something that's still evolving in my mind but yeah. I do think that that's significant that Max is the one person that reaches that without because you could argue that the, her speech to Anne is exactly that moment mm -hmm. that is that moment where she has turned away from the things that were her you know her non-productive or however you want to talk about sure. it motivations and yet she not only survives she actually gets that thing in anyway. yeah i'm very serious about having a whole show just talking about max with you because i think this is crucial i think there are two ways of looking at it i think it's exactly what you just said and the other possible interpretation is that max is one of the characters who is somewhat left behind by the show's transition to a mythic tone mm -hmm. a mythic register in the fourth season yeah. absolutely she, she is living in the real world more than anyone including yeah. jack yeah, yeah. yes That'll be fun. Okay, but we're not going to just talk about Max right now. Except we are definitely not doing that right now. If it's finally my turn, Your Excellency King Daphne. <gasps> oh, oh, my dear. I am so sorry. Elizabeth Stevens, I apologize. Please. Okay. Tell me, tell me everything you think and feel. Well, I was going to say, Max is my pick for most fulfilled potential. I absolutely Yay. think that she's my pick. Um, and because of all the reasons that were pretty much just covered, so mm -hmm. I don't have to necessarily go into them. But yes, on her own terms, she consistently moved forward. She never, that I can recall right now, took a step backwards as a character that I can recall or was held down for long. Um, she consistently moved forward. She, uh, yeah, she conquered her own demons. She made mistakes. And even, and I think you could argue that it took her a while to fully realize those and to um, make what amends that she could for them. But ultimately, she looked them in the face and, uh, and grew because of them. And when I saw her up on that balcony in the season finale, or the series finale, rather, I, there was just a surge of fierce pride. And remember, we talked mm -hmm. about her yeah, being um, in that tent in, in Charles Vane's camp early on when she's wrapped in the sailcloth. And like that, I mean, that is Max in a nutshell, I think. She will always make the best of her situation and her circumstance. And she did it beautifully. Um, and for least fulfilled, I think that the strongest argument is for Billy. I would agree with that. I would agree with what Alistair said in the beginning. Um, but I'm still really, really disappointed in Madi showing back up there with Silver on the top of that ledge. I, yeah. and especially knowing what I know about Treasure Island, that Queen Madi is now, a, what, like an innkeeper's wife or something? I, yeah. ah, I don't like this. And I don't know what happens between here and now, but I would say she does not live up to her potential at all. And I think it's the most grievous, even more so than Billy, just because um, I don't think that Billy could have ever accomplished as much as Madi had the potential of accomplishing. Oh, no, sure. It's a smaller scale story. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I think that might be my yeah. argument for least. She had her okay. war stolen from her. She mm -hmm. did. Yeah. Oh, although I need to put in here, Mapleton. Uh -huh. Also, <laughs> oh, my lowly oh, Andrew, Andrew, your your devotion, your devotion to Mapleton just gives me joy. Seated at say. the right hand of the real power of NASA. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Oh, well we done. Did not mention Adele and Featherstone for most of them. I know. Yes. That's true. I know. I know. For Although real. I kind huh? of lucked into a lot of that. I yeah. feel like. 
Well, I although in know, hindsight, I don't know if I agree with that appointed. with Adele. Maybe they were appointed. I, no, no, Adele's right. devotion, Adele's devotion to Matt, and especially because now I've been yeah. doing this rewatch, like that has been built from the very beginning. Adele's devotion to okay. Max and how she learns from Max. Okay. I mean, we have our infamous seduction conversation in front of Jack. Yes. But it starts before that, but she's helping Max from the very beginning. And I, I just put a lot of thought into the moment where Max where Adele's like, hey, you know, are you afraid of Anne? What's going on here? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I can take care of this situation. And and she learned, I feel like that was the moment that where where Max is like, absolutely not. This woman defended me when no one else will. She will be protected. Mm-hmm. That speaks directly to season four, Adele. Mm-hmm. Adele and... gets everything she deserves in the Black right, Sail. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Featherstone's exactly. picture is labeled most dizzyingly elevated. <laughs> Right, exactly. Uh, by, that by, does drive but, home well, at the end of his story. He certainly was the best navigator on that island. Uh, <laughs> this is true. This is true. And I mean, this goes to a question we're about to have about about who loves best. I mean, I think Fe- oh. Featherstone's greatest, his greatest trait is I am. I have the love of a good woman. I have gotta oh, say, so cute. He stated it in. He stated it in. Uh-huh. And he, he wasn't wrong. Mm-hmm. Maybe she didn't love him so much at the moment, but his elevation is really because of Adele. And so his devotion to Adele, got to say, he gets credit for that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the, of the line, right? That behind every great man is a woman rolling her eyes. Oh, <laughs> and oh my God. In that way, I'm remembering Adele's response <laughs> to him saying, I have the love of a good woman. And that actually is kind of fitting of a governor's wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Right. Where he says, "Will I be less attractive to you?" After yes. I yeah. My part? <laughs> God, I love those two. <laughs> Craig and Lisa, we love you. God, Very that much. was too much fun. That whole thing was so fun. <laughs> oh, right. Um, well, we didn't. I think we we all focused very much on who fulfilled their potential and less so on who didn't. But I think that might end up in other conversations. I don't know. Does anyone feel the need to say someone who did not fulfill their potential? Yeah, I guess. Um, I have strong opinions about Eleanor and where she ended up oh, and the sure. whole Woods Roger storyline, which we haven't really, Daphne, you and I haven't really had a chance to talk about, but let me tell I you, know. Elizabeth and I have had some conversations. Um, oh, interesting. I don't like where Eleanor ended up. I don't feel as oh, though really? she inhabited her potential. I don't feel as though she uh-huh. transcended her innate, um, her, I don't know. Those qualities which are innate to her and those qualities which were layered upon her, the narrative which was layered mm-hmm. upon her. So I find Eleanor a tragic figure, not because of any flaw in herself, but because of bitter circumstance. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I agree with that. Yeah. I still don't know exactly where I stand on all of that because I had such I strong feelings about Eleanor and Woods Rogers as the show progressed. It took yes. so much by surprise where they ended up that I still haven't sorted it all out mm-hmm. very well. I think it'll be on rewatch mm-hmm. that some of those things really start to cement for me because it was it was such a turn that I wasn't expecting. Yeah, I was consistently right. surprised listening to Phantoms Deep of the... Um, I, I don't want to say love. love our enthusiasm for Woods Rogers because he never connected with me. <laughs> That's right, you never character. liked him. Well, it was never that I didn't like, like him. I think it's a yeah, fantastic also Lauren. I think he's a super engaging character, but uh-huh. he's also a monster, you guys. And from the yeah. beginning, you always From the yeah. first to the last. No, you he were right. Yeah. the pirate right. king of Nassau. And, and yeah. I, I never bought or, or certainly never liked his relationship with Eleanor. I saw that as a complete betrayal. And Lauren, I know that we are on the same page with this. <laughs> He was her glorified jailer. I feel like the show never yes. acknowledged that. It was such a bizarre power dynamic that the show just didn't yeah. acknowledge. Um, I'm, and- uh, I, I'm horrified with myself for not <laughs> going down that route. It's funny. Like, it's so unlike me. Because, so, yeah, these I'm usually the first person to call out shit like that. Uh, he and then had me. Just, he I, I had me like, there too. <laughs> you had me there too. Uh, that's Eleanor awesome. died deceiving herself to the very end about what he's yeah. like. She yeah. says too many yeah. goddamn men here, and she dies. And this goddamn man, it's his fault. I know. Yeah. And Flint yeah. even pointed that out to yeah. her. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, Eleanor. Mm, yeah, that's right. I know. I know. All right, let's move on to the next thing. This one is Andrew. So Andrew, I'm going to I'm going to bring this up, but I would like you to maybe elaborate on what what question you're asking here. 
Andrew said, We are least rational when we are most vulnerable as a potential thesis for the show. Who inhabits it and who defies it? Make your pitch for this being the, the, the thesis statement, Andrew. I'm very interested in this. Oh, I feel like more than maybe anything from the beginning of the show, the, the other side of this would be that desperation breeds dangerous decision making. Sure. Mm. Okay. Right. Um, I, I, but I think the, the thing that's fascinating to me is I don't know that many characters remain on one side of this or the other throughout. But I think that you could you could develop a really interesting reading of a message the show is sending just by following when and where people falter and how much they learn from those mistakes. Like, I think that <laughs> the story that got us here is a story of two men who were very irrational. I mean, it's kind of a dance of being vulnerable while being irrational and Miranda seeing the whole thing. Uh, the inability to stop um, the inability to make the right call when your passions are burning. Yes. Uh, that, that's kind of where McGraw starts. Right. And then Flint is kind of implied to be the opposite of that, but then we're kind of shown that he's still embodying that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the other side, because I think Flint does internalize it at some point, that he stops. That might be because there's no one left li alive to make him vulnerable. Um, and that might be a, a case for it that the most rational people are the ones who have nothing left to live, which is kind of an inversion of what you usually think. Mm -hmm. It's also um, kind of an inversion of what Silver was claiming about Flint. Exactly, yeah. That having no connections grants a person rationale. And again, maybe we'll get to that talking about the darkness. I don't really know if Silver's wrong or right there. But on the other side of it, the people who in this show who were – almost the most rational from beginning to end are the people who were born into vulnerability. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that maybe the most fascinating thing that Max or, or Anne, Max and Charles are kind of figures that stand apart as the most cruelly rational at times, but they are people who, who's, essence is is vulnerability and, and they all kind of bring that up at, at different points that that has fundamentally shaped their identity uh and then you kind of have jack bumping up against it too who's usually a rational guy who's vulnerable for Anne um yeah. at, at times i just think that's such interesting it comes off as such an axiom you know that it's mm -hmm. uh you know well, well when your feelings are up you're not thinking clearly um but i feel like this entire show kind of raises that as that is such a more complicated statement about sure. what it means to be a person and mm -hmm. love and weigh risks and kind of become who you are or are not going to be. Like, yeah. would, would Flint have become a better person or would McGraw have become a better person had he not met Thomas and been horribly wounded by that for most of his life? Or maybe he would have never become a great person. I mean, that's the thing is maybe, maybe th that experience is what made him the... He's very rational, but is he is is he is he a good it's a, person? Exactly, it's cold rational. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, the I mean, cold yeah. rationality yeah. can be the best virtue that you might hope for in the service of your community. It can be sure. particularly as as we're introduced to the this concept of civilization, the concept of the empire. Cold rationality right. seems to be one of their most powerful resources. You, but you actually have to, I mean, I think, uh, well, we don't really know much about McGraw's life before mm -hmm. he met Thomas, obviously, because that's when we see his earlier life start. But, mm -hmm. but cold rationality makes you a very effective person. If you choose to use that in the direction of good for people, then that's great. But I'm sure, not sure McGraw yeah. was that person. Um, perhaps, perhaps. Right? He was, the only thing we know about him before Thomas is that he was rising high in the ranks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that he had Which, some amount of darkness that made him a good leader. Is that he was at least possessed of the virtues valued by his culture and his community. That he was he was a good officer, even if that doesn't yes. necessarily mean he was a good man. Yeah, which is that. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the heartbreak, the experience he went through of of going through that ration, irrationality because of vulnerability and coming out the other side is what made him a good person. That yeah. had mm. had he been able to continue. Perhaps he would have, with this current integration, he would have actually been a person trying to do good for the world 
using his ability to be a rational, effective person. I think that the opposition of vulnerability and rationality is a fascinating one because it's not a dichotomy with which we're often presented. I think the idea that that when we are vulnerable, we are less likely to act in a rational and consistent fashion is not a perspective that you often get, I Uh think, on, on human psychology. But I think that what both sides of this dichotomy speak to is simply humanity, that we are able to take less rational action for less rational reasons, that we are able to define ourselves by those things which we hold dear, which are themselves irrational, that we will go to extraordinary lengths to protect Mahdi, for example. We will go to extraordinary lengths to fight an unwinnable war against an unconquerable foe for the future of NASA. We will do these things not because they are rational, but because they are human. And I think that Black Sail's treatment of humanity as as the primary virtue is is completely fascinating yeah well it's also that ties into that dragon speech scene um Mm -hmm. because i think what was so interesting to me is that i think most people watch season four expecting silver to along the way become more powerful than flint and of course by the end flint was not silver was not more powerful than flint flint was undone because he let silver and Mm-hmm. He let yeah. Silver be the object of him doing, because as we both said um, in uh, 409, uh, when Flint shoots Dooley, uh, we were all like, wow, Flint loves Silver. And that's because that yeah. action is the same way. Mm-hmm. That's like Vane beheading Ned Low. It's like sure. Jack mm-hmm. ferociously going after Redcoats after saying, Anne, get up. Um, right. And so Flint it's was like Jack vulnerable. raising that white flag. It, exactly. It's like Jack raising that white flag and uh, resulting in Teach's death. Um, and so Flint is undone by Silver because Flint was vulnerable to him. He could have easily continued, just shot Silver. He could have, he's a better fighter than him, even though he did train him. He could have gone mm-hmm. on and succeeded in his war. Yeah. I, well, and there's also the word vulnerable doesn't come up much, but I, I believe Silver says that the other people in Flint's life died because they were more vulnerable than him. He says that they, they had less, uh, you know, they had, more to lose they had mm-hmm, right um and so he kind of implies that the people that flint associated himself with ended up being more vulnerable than flint and therefore fell apart right. like we saw that with gates but i don't know that the show like that statement suggests that being rational is good and i don't know if the show even comes down on that because the heroic figures are the ones who are, like you said, fighting the unwinnable war, have a dream that something can be better, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that isn't treated as foolish, or I don't think it is. I would think, Um, I I would argue that the show emphatically states the contrary, that 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 kind of reckless heroism is lauded. We look at Miranda's death and we look at Charles Vane's mm -hmm. death. These are futile gestures, which are themselves inherently true and heroic. Yeah, and that when you, yeah, when you invest, Right. Mm-hmm. When you when you have so much to lose, you might not make the smart decision, but you are more likely to make the right one. But <laughs> again, I think what John said is everyone in this who's making the cold rational decision are the ones making a better world for <laughs> for us all to live in. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, mm-hmm. sure. Because I think part of this this dynamic is the conflict between civilization and the frontier. That when you're on the frontier, you get to be heroic and you get to be rational, you get to be impetuous and make irrational decisions. But when you are a part of civilization, you are obligated to fulfill your social obligation. You don't get to be Charles Vane if you are a British naval officer, if you are building a better world. But that's that's not the same as rationality, though. I mean, I I actually am going to argue that the that the show like almost everything else in the worldview of black sales, when it gives you two things it's going to argue for both of them. Mm-hmm. Mm. So I don't think that the show is actually arguing You're for You're talking reason, right? Rationality as it relates to reason, probably. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So I, I not, I, you know, I mean, yes, the show on the one side is making a Flint a heroic, a vain heroic. And yet the show also, it gave you the very clear message that a Max is going to not only succeed i mean that's the thing max does not succeed as a villain she succeeds as a person who succeeds and takes everyone along with her so i i gotta say i'm not really sure i think that the show is actually arguing both sides of this and this is why the season finale is so so emotionally and intellectually interesting because 
it's arguing both points in that as well. Like the save the world versus the save your people and, 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 you know, and save yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. The build a wall. Exactly. So it's not like you go in there and you're like, Flint is good. Silver is bad. You can see both sides and it's the same Mm -hmm. with this. Like, and that's truer than a show arguing for one side or another. I mean, it's truer Mm -hmm. to humanity Mm -hmm. is that, yes, those two things like darkness and light, like so many things that sure. we have opposing each other in this world, they they both exist. One of them, you know, you'll have moments where one of them will rise and one of them will fall, but there's never really a clear argument mm-hmm. for one being right and one being wrong. That's just too simple for black sales. Like being liked and feared. Like being liked and feared. Although we found out you can actually do both of those at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Of those all don't... In the world, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you just made me. I was Flint a minute ago. Now you just made me silver? <laughs> Where does one end and the other begin? Yeah. <laughs> they have one mind. <laughs> mm-hmm. Awesome. I am Flint and Silver. Not really sure that's what I wanted in life. <laughs> These were not my life goals. Um, okay. Uh, w- does anyone have anything else to say about rationality and vulnerability? We didn't really I'll... talk about which which uh, characters inhabit these things. So does anyone? Oh, I, I, that's a very big conversation. I, that was the problem is I wanted to raise it. As that's well. your question, dear. <laughs> I know. Well, in that case, can and I that, ask that you to clarify of... something for me, Andrew? Because I feel like I, I feel like you're associating mm. very strongly then the, the vulnerability with, I, I guess you want to call it like blind emotion, like an emotion that's so strong that it that it's blocking your Ooh, this is Liz's capacity topic. for rationality and for reason. Because, I mean, that's something that we've certainly talked about on the podcast a couple of times when we talked about rage cloaking itself and whatever it must mm, and how really sure. any strong emotion can do that. It, is, is that at the heart of vulnerability for you when you're making this? statement or is there is there uh more subtlety to it that i'm not yeah i mean i guess i'm definitely the most direct i think that's what makes for me the because you you have talked about that that when eleanor especially you know can get caught up in in her feelings and that um but that was that's what makes it so interesting to me that max and uh or max ann and jack where jack I don't know. Maybe, maybe I was alone in this, but when he was on that boat faced with, you know, I'm going to lose my captaincy. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, so I, I felt like he was most rational in that moment. Um, But he was never thinking just for himself, I guess is, is what I took from that is he and Anne were, were so twin like um, that when one was vulnerable, they, they kind of have that interesting play where it seemed like, Max or Anne in the in the belly of that ship mm-hmm. was not worried about herself, uh, you know, being hurt. Yes. Or at least I didn't think she was. She was worried about other people being hurt and probably the one person there least likely to defend themselves, mm-hmm. uh, who would be Jack, that his vulnerability gave her clarity. Interesting. And, and I feel mm-hmm. like that is such an interesting idea because it seems to me that most stories would – play it the other way, you know, um, that Anne volunteering herself to fight does not read the same to me as Katniss Everdeen saying, I volunteer, you know, that <laughs> one, one is an active. <laughs> okay. Now, now I and want something with Katniss complete, Everdeen yeah. and, and Anne in the same, in the same movie. <laughs> yeah. But they're both heroic actions. They're both heroic sacrifices. One is made out of desperation and mm. the other is, is framed as the reasonable Right, the the rational decision mm-hmm, sure. and interesting. I, and I, I find it so interesting that um, Charles Fane and and Max are people who come from slavery, and Anne, who was basically a slave, that vulnerability is so integral to who they are that it seems in those moments they become more rational, more reasonable. That when Max had the most to lose, she was the most shrewd. And interesting, it, 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 uh-huh. there wasn't the you know, frantic in the way that Eleanor was, where it kind of comes slipping through her fingers. I just find that such an interesting statement about people who come from oppression uh, and people who were born, you know, but powerful women born into power, I don't think did very well in this story. Uh, mm. No. That's well, that tr- was wow. Eleanor that and is Maddie. true. 
Right. Yeah. Well, and Miranda. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I also think that this all comes into the, I kind of mentioned this to you, Daphne, about where your national identity is, evolution versus revolution, that yes, whether you're brought up in the idea that a violent uh, rebellion on proper grounds is the best or is the way forward. You know, some people would say that's the only way that real change happens. And I think McGraw feels that. Just a quick explanation uh, to our listeners. Andrew and I have talked about this a bit, is this idea of revolution versus evolution. So I guess, actually, Andrew, you are kind of the one evolution person in this fivesome. The Mm -hmm. three women are Americans, history of revolution. Mm -hmm. Andrew, Canadian, Mm -hmm. history of evolution. (laughs) Alistair, where would you place yourself in all of this? Well, as a Scotsman, born and raised, I kind of have to put myself on, I I suppose, the side of thwarted revolution. <laughs> um, so yeah, so sorry, Andrew, I totally interrupted you, but now go on with that because it is really an interesting idea about culture and worldview in relation to to uh, our characters that some of them are in favor of one and then some in favor of the other. Yeah, I, I think that is just maybe it's it's just worth calling out because I think people don't stop to to think about the the idea that. Um, independence through revolution is how countries get formed. And I feel mm-hmm. like uh, a person could, could read Flint's view of the world as justifying that, that empires, <laughs> em- empirical control is only fought off. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that's, that's kind of an interesting idea because not all countries are, are made that way. And um a person could look at I, th- I think the problem is that you would look at Jack and Max and, and feel that there's some sort of uh, betrayal or not necessarily betrayal, but maybe surrender mm-hmm. um, to, to kind of making the best that you can. But uh, I, I think that that is just worth I think it would be rewarding for people to consider that when mm-hmm. you're especially weighing Silver's argument against Flint's because Silver is a smart guy and I don't think he is emotionally irrational in that moment. I I think in in his Mm -hmm. mind, he's just making um, a bargain that other people would not. I think that it is not the same as other characters who make irrational choices or unheroic decisions based Mm -hmm. on emotion. I think that Silver in the end, not completely, but I think that he takes a step over to the side of Max and Jack at least in those final scenes that I think is interesting to consider because up to that point, he's been at odds with them. Hmm. Uh, Can you just real quickly for our very international audience, can you just explain why you might have this view as a Canadian, as opposed to American for people that don't know Canadian history? Oh, because uh, Canada never revolted. We never uh, held a revolution. We pursued nationhood, um, you know, through parliament and, and democracy. And I think we were made the dominion of Canada, which was a separate country. And I think we are still in the Commonwealth, but not, right. not, a, not as other places. But right. yeah, it is the evolution versus revolution right next to America. America fought for it in Canada, uh, you know, a hundred years later. Um, got it. Uh, Very politely. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that is how we do things. <laughs> had to put that in there i couldn't help myself (laughs) um (laughs) so yeah so that is i mean yeah andrew and i had this conversation a while ago i have been thinking about that a lot i do think that the show again like other things really is not necessarily arguing one way or the other but showing the virtues of both and Mm. the downsides of both i mean just yeah just i feel like there's just a lot of meat in there like that could also be I just feel like almost anything we say here could be a whole episode of Fathoms Deep that's not me promising that it's just it just <laughs> yeah. feels like it could be it's just each topic it just has so many ways that you could discuss it I mean Flint might be wrong then in, in his claims about the British Empire if, if you want to pursue that but then you get into mm-hmm. the question of whether he's talking about an empire or empire or people 
Right. Well, and that gets a little muddy because in the dragon yeah. speech, I think he's talking about culture and civilization at least as much as he's talking about the empire. I mean, he's talking, he, I feel like that was a big change for him. I mean, yes, he's talked about civilization and he's talked about the empire. Um, in that moment, I think what he's talking more about than anything is culture and, and how people are oppressed by stories told in culture. He's not necessarily talking about England when he's talking about the idea of casting shadows and saying that there's monsters in the shadows and forcing people to be in the light that has been designated for them. That's not about England. Oh, so he even ascends in that. Yeah. Because, hmm. I mean, he's speaking for all humanity then. Yeah, exactly. This is my point. I think that this is that is the moment he has let go of his personal trauma, his personal anger. He's integrated his own experience as an oppressed person into yes. something that is truly universal, mm -hmm. into an idea that could be used to tell so many stories of people for whom a story or about whom a story has been told that makes other people shun them and that also also is oppressive to the people of of the inside of civilization that's the part that amazed me about this speech it's not just about we the pirates who will be have a story told of us that is us as monsters it's about how the people who are told to only live within the light how the story of us as monsters will be used to to control them that even the that even the main part of the culture, the the people, the dominant culture, is also in chains. Hmm. Yeah, and the ways to which this conflict between civilization and the frontier is really a conflict between unity and disunity. That right. the the permissive aspect of life on the frontier, the permissive aspect of of life in NASA, encourages that kind of anarchic disunity. Whereas in order to be, you can be a good pirate while being Charles Vane. And giving, right. if you'll excuse me, zero fucks. You cannot <laughs> right. be that guy and be a good naval officer, be a good British citizen. Sure. You can't right. integrate right. into that society and still occupy that that transgressive role. So that tension is inevitable. And Miranda brings that up in that carriage mm -hmm. with James, yeah. where she says that there are different, you know, the reasons why men go to sea. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Yeah, and she absolutely. talks exactly about that, about how, and he talks exactly about how, like, this whole not worrying about what people think is not so great for, for a military. Yeah. And, and she talks about that, that people go, I mean, this, the whole idea of crossing that ocean, you know, which is a big part of the flashbacks, this whole idea uh -huh. of crossing the ocean to go somewhere where you could live a different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is part of what the, their, that's part of their continual conversation in the flashbacks of like that people choose this so that they can live outside of those strictures sure. live outside of gossip i mean gossip think about gossip how that has you know shame and gossip has goes from the very first episode mm -hmm. to the dragon speech the dragon yeah. speech is about that too it's one of the most interesting and one of the most i think subtle oppositions in the entire show and and you kind of have to look for it but the difference between thomas and james mcgraw and let's say max and Anne, and even max and Anne and jack the mm -hmm. different treatment of those relationships, which would be scandalous, would be at the very least provocative yeah. in the civilized world, is an entirely private and personal matter on the frontier. Mm -hmm. That these these somewhat transgressive relationships, tr transgressive by the standards of, of civilized society sure. at this time, mm -hmm. these transgressive relationships are simply given space on the frontier. They're, they're given yep. air on the frontier. And this is one of the reasons that civilization has to continually move forward to conquer the frontier, because if you don't, the frontier grows more powerful and will conquer you in return. Right. Well, and you have no shadows left. Exactly. If you right. shine light into all of the yeah. shadows, there are no shadows left. There's no way to control the culture. There's no yeah. shame. There's no gossip anymore. Mm hmm. Jeez. And Silver is this conflict embodied in a human because even though we don't know what his backstory mm. is, he's presumably been oppressed because otherwise why would he join mm -hmm. the life of piracy? And yet right. what he basically did was take disenfranchised oppressed people and say, hey, your fight isn't really worth it. I'm going to stand in the way of your fight. And yet he's presumably also been oppressed and disenfranchised. So he's maybe internalized that in, in order to say your fight is not worth it. Mm -hmm. Your fight is not worth it. My story, whatever it is of oppression, even though everyone else has told theirs, is not worth looking at. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> 
We're all just basking. We're all just basking in brilliance right now. God damn. <laughs> yep, it's so good. All righty. Um, let's move on. Actually, this is also, I guess this is also an Andrew question that I also stuck my own questions into. I put them together. Yeah, this is an easy one. <laughs> This super easy question, just like one word answers. Darkness. <laughs> <laughs> what does the show have to say about darkness? I mean, it's funny. We just talked about the shadows and the light. I was going to say, and that's actually really important to talk about, I think. Yes, it is. I put kind of sub questions in here, but um, let me just throw out the sub questions and anyone can answer any part of this that they want about the darkness. There's just, it's too, it's just actually too big a issue like again that could be like five episodes just talking about darkness and what it means in black sales this would be really but... cheerful episodes <laughs> <laughs> we'd all feel real good at the end of that discussion <laughs> alistair welcome to discussing black I know sales. This, <laughs> this is always my answer when anyone says wait isn't this supposed to be fun um, <laughs> um okay so what does the show have to say about darkness? Because that's not a small question. Thank you, Andrew. My smaller questions were, does Silver resist or succumb to the darkness? Mm -hmm. Does Flint, I think we this one we've addressed quite a bit, does Flint emerge from his darkness? Uh, and then, oh, the, I think this is actually the thing I, I, I yeah. added was, was, was Silver talking about Flint's darkness all that time in season three when he needed a tether and such? Or was he actually projecting? I used to always think it was super about Flint, but now I'm starting to wonder. Mm -hmm. Season four made me question whether Silver's talking about Flint's darkness at all. Well, I think that ties into the question of does he resist or succumb? And I think he succumbs while telling himself that he resists. Oh, interesting. Hmm. I agree uh, with that. As oh, Wow, uh -huh. look at you, Lauren, with the actual short answer. I, I, yeah. think, I mean, what do you guys think? I think I agree with Lauren. Except I would possibly put a question mark next to the word succumb and maybe replace it with embrace. Oh, it feels as if someone moves voluntarily into darkness because the darkness is where the power is. Yeah, right. The darkness is also where the where the where the metaphorical dragons are. <laughs> See, that's what I was going to ask. They aren't is real that, dragons. It, it was that intentional, do you think? But by the writers, all of this talk about darkness and. And then using that that shadow and light, because then a lot of oh, the yeah. darkness that you're, you're you're certain, okay, because a lot of the the darkness that we're talking about in season three, um, I, I think they had a very specific negative connotation of like this is evil, this is wickedness, this is um, depravity of man, and then we get Flint speech about those shadows being. Uh, rather than, I, I guess, rather than darkness being a presence, that it's simply an absence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the absence of light rather than, you know, in a very scientific sort of way. Uh, so we do think that that was purposefully done. That's very interesting because otherwise I think it can get pretty confusing. Um, I like that then. Yeah. No, go ahead did that thing that this show often does to us is that we think we get super comfortable with definitions of things and what mm -hmm. we think we understand about the world. And then it's like, Oh, sorry. Can I turn that on its head? Yeah. Let yeah, me just take it, that rug out from under your feet. <laughs> right. Because Flint says they paint the world with shadows, but that implies that there isn't anything actually dark, which he right. doesn't believe. Uh, I, it's so interesting to me, and it, it, at the time, and it's only become more interesting to me that the word "evil" is not used, um, mm -hmm. because it almost seems that Flint is not once. Yeah, yeah. Wow. and Flint is not. It's not a good evil. You know, it's not binary. I think Flint kind of embraces that. It, and even McGraw, when we first met him, kind of he embraced the idea that it's all perspective. You know, um, that. Pirates aren't monsters. They're not actually yeah. dark. And that's not what evil is or, or badness. But I don't know. That That is so interesting to me. And I think that's one that I would life, love to hear people talk about is if choosing the safety of your own family is being claimed by your worst parts. Like that, that, that's such a 
because I don't like the question that it makes me ask myself. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that, that, you know, <laughs> because build a wall and save who you sorry, can. Sorry, yeah. sorry, evil laugh. <laughs> yeah. I say evil. <laughs> that uh, build a wall and save who you can is viewed as protectionist, but um, rarely seen as evil. And that's not maybe why they use the word evil, because it is kind of a yeah. dark decision, right? Save who you can implies that you're not going to save everyone. But it is a very human. It's a very realistic. It's it's yeah. It's, there, there is no person who doesn't, to some extent, even revolutionaries do that thing, unless you're mad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the the thing that I kind of have thought about it since I even raised that question to you, and we both came to it was, I've had that thinking too. Is when we took it as the moment where Silver began to understand how Flint became who he became, and said, you know. The thing you fail to tell me is when you start straying from the path or start being cruel or start rationalizing or justifying these things, that it feels good. And I don't think it felt good to Flint. I think that that in the oh, moment I took it as yes. true, but but it, it's kind of bumped up against – he shot those two men, which was seen as mm. extreme, and – as time went by, we saw it as an act of reason and something he hated doing and something right. that destroyed him, uh, which implies that almost the darkness is having an opposite effect on, on Silver, which just makes me rethink that entire look that Flint gave him. Um, because he, he looked at him almost like, oh, you're, I, you're, I'm starting to make you in my image. And mm-hmm. if you are of the mind that Flint did not like doing those wrong things they did not Mm -hmm. feel good to him then he was looking at him like what are you becoming yeah and yeah incredulity of course Uh Mm -hmm. i just but i I just think that's so and then we have the end scene i guess which depends on how you read the ending of the show but you have silver embracing darkness on a level that flint would have never even considered right flint always talked about wanting to get rid of that mantle and wanting to get rid of the name and hating the name more every day whereas silver was really leaning into it and drawing in that power i think that's very good oh, it gives me the heebie-jeebies yeah very good <laughs> very bad yes <laughs> Well, I think even more than anyone else's relationship on the show, Flint and Silver's relationship has been one of projecting their thoughts and desires onto, onto each other. other. Of course, um, sure, sure, exactly. So, uh, what? Yeah. So, however you want to interpret that look that Flint gave Silver, it was whatever he was projecting. Uh, and I, I think towards the end, I think in that dragon speech, they saw each other for who they truly were in that moment. Hmm. I mean, what do you think? Ooh, well, oh, that's interesting. If I would take that as I think Silver was projecting who he had become mm-hmm. onto Flint, who sat before him. But I read it as Flint recognizing how wrong that projection was, that that's why he seemed so defeated. That, that almost, mm-hmm. like the way you would look at a child who misunderstood something you were trying to teach them. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that it, it, Flint was looking at him like, there's no going back from this, like the damage is done or yeah. I can see your conviction. And that is what I was afraid of, you know, almost that while silver thinks that I've escaped it, but, but I don't know. It's made all the more fascinating by the fact that I think silver at the start of that makes a really compelling case that, you know, I, I wanted to watch the world burn mm-hmm. um, in, in your name, which is such a, I don't know, is, is the embodiment of darkness and heroism in a romantic sense. Uh, that it, it just makes me so uncomfortable, which is just so strange because when Flint gave that speech about darkness, it seemed like it had so much finality to it mm-hmm. that it was almost, you know, strap in for season four because we're going to prove this. And what it really was was strap in for season four because we're going to make you question if even this is right. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. And but then, oh, but then I have to ask if Jack <laughs> were, were Jack's decisions made through fueled by darkness. Do we do we ascribe that to Max just because they didn't invite it? Well, he was fueled by darkness at the beginning of season four when he was just out for blood with the redcoats, and mm-hmm. Anne had to give him that pep talk. Charles Vane is dead. Right. Like, why would you right. die yeah. just to appease a dead man? Mm. 
Oh, gosh. That was a thing he had to get over. And then by the end, he said, I don't want Flint's treasure. That doesn't lead anywhere good. I'm going to turn away from Flint's treasure, which uh, at the end of season two, when he looks at Flint's treasure, he is literally looking at a room full of shiny light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, very, it's made literal. Oh, <laughs> fascinating. That's brilliant. <laughs> Wait a minute. I have a quick question now. Sure. Uh, you know, back back to the thing I'm always obsessed with, which is people's, you know, earlier childhood, whatever we're going to call them, traumas, and when they when they are motivated by that and when they get out of it. Is a character's darkness when they are motivated by trauma and not having fulfilled that trauma? I think the show does make a case for that. Mm. Oh but I gosh. think... In, in a sense, I, I wonder if that's so broad as to be like fundamental to the art of storytelling, that, that, that characters are motivated by events. So when a character is motivated toward right. darkness, it is going to be motivated by a negative event or trauma. Um, no, that's true, except that this show is be... really about that thing. It's really, really, sure, really about sure, sure. that thing to where each character has a trauma that we learn, right. but if except you're talking over... About foundational trauma mm -hmm. then that doesn't account for the arc of a character like billy toward darkness for example even woods rogers i'm not sure you can say that his his trauma his his you know the inciting incident for his dark arc is foundational in that same sense right oh uh, except i think billy's is i think that i it's funny like we talked earlier i don't remember who maybe this was with andrew when we were talking <laughs> about billy sorry a lot, a lot of podcasts <laughs> um <laughs> Where we were talking about who tells Billy's story, and I've actually changed my mind about what mm -hmm. is Billy's trauma. It's not actually being stolen from his parents. It's mm -hmm. the moment when he killed oh. the person who did it. Yeah, that he can't mm -hmm. go back to his parents after that, right? Exactly. Oh, uh -huh. So yeah. Billy's, and this is Andrew, this is 100% based on Andrew's stuff. So the Billy's thing that we didn't notice was his darkness. The thing that we didn't notice he was acting out the acting out from motivation from a trauma was goodness hmm. was actually goodness was Andrew's whole thing about whether he's good is that his trauma was actually in a way I guess created by himself mm -hmm. and and that Billy then passes that on to Dufresne Billy becomes the person who who actually creates like like Tom said the creator of monsters he creates monsters by supporting them when they uh -huh. do horrible things. And so mm. Billy has actually, in the most quiet way, I guess more quiet even than Anne, been acting out motivations from his own trauma the whole time. Mm -hmm. Wow, which casts such a profound shadow over the, the mythopoeia of Long John Silver. Because right. you're absolutely right. If Billy is responsible for, in part, the creation of monsters, if he is, in a sense, the anti-Gates, which... I think right. it's a really interesting he is the anti you know, then yeah. the creation of the myth of Long John Silver is much, much darker, even from its conception, than mm -hmm. the show would, would, on a superficial reading, lead you to believe. So yeah, Billy yeah, basically created his own... this whole show again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we just get together in like three months thing. and do this whole show again? That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> we can do this forever. Every three months for the rest of my life, that would be fantastic. <laughs> so yeah, this is my new thing about Billy, is that Billy was always a darker character than we thought, and right. that he basically, he didn't create his own trauma, but he kind of did. And then he just passed that along by, mm -hmm. by supporting other people in becoming monsters. But he became who he thought Flint was, oh. right? Even even down to explicitly saying, "You're all the same now." Mm -hmm. You know, right. it's I just mean, me. He became that more than Flint ever was. I mean, also yeah. his yeah. idea of who Flint was was never who Flint was. He was always framing this based on some idea of good and evil, and and um, and good intentions. Mm -hmm towards people that was not really based in reality. I mean, Flint, for all of his crazy behavior and horrible things that he did, there is some kernel always of uh, aspiration to good intentions. <laughs> that's, that's the most I'll offer him sometimes. <laughs> well, which is in a way kind of more than Billy ever had. Mm. Yeah, um, Billy lacked introspection. I, I feel like we can also right. chalk him up as 
where yep. the, yeah exactly exactly i'm That's really starting really to think sure. more and more because of silver because of 409 and silver's refusal to talk about his backstory mm-hmm. i just gotta say john and luke you all rocked it in our interviews because you thought you were underplaying the the thing and you were nervous about us not actually yep. getting the backstory when you were telling us to not. A- the non backstory is the, <laughs> the most powerful thing in the world. And I love it. And this is just it. It changed my whole perspective on so many things about mm-hmm. black sales. So I love it. I yeah, the hierarchy so of power in black sales goes from lowest to highest, being under the control, under the dominion of someone else's story, being in control of your own story, and then being liberated from stories existing right. outside uh-huh. of the frame of narrative. Again, a perfect segue. Let's go to my next topic. <laughs> this is my topic, and I love it. My very special question that could be anticipated because it's something I talk about a lot lately is one story as power this is not a new thing liz Liz and i've been talking about this throughout and different variations on this idea but i feel like the end of season four brought this into a totally new light that alistair kind of touched on just now which is brings us to introspection i mean i think the idea of store one story as power or one having someone else's story as power or refusing to give someone's story as a type of power has a new meaning now because if you bring this introspection concept into it like i argued pretty much for all of season four was it or maybe even to season three that like silver was more powerful because he was still holding on to his own story Mm -hmm. i'm gonna argue now that silver is actually less powerful interesting because his he doesn't see the wrist to his refusal well i used to say that you know and this is clearly true in Black Sails, that if you have someone else's story, you have power over them. Silver, which is demonstrated very specifically when Silver uses Israel Hand's story, that is the moment where Israel Hand sure. is, feels seen and, and aligns himself with Silver. Right, like the fairy I had had the yeah. Exactly, like the fairy tale name thing. I had assumed that Silver holding on to his own backstory was holding on to that power for himself and not allowing other people to have that power over him. I now believe that Silver not recognizing, because now I understand that he wasn't just holding on to it, he was refusing to recognize the power of his own story, even though he uses stories of other people. I think this, that this ties into introspection because this means Silver wasn't holding on to the power of the story the story was holding on to the power over him by refusing mm-hmm. to recognize the power of his story. The story has the power. So, you know, this is like a ba- really basic kind of psychological concept, like that if you don't confront your past, mm-hmm. that past has power of you. That past motivates you again, tying into my whole thing about people being motivated by past trauma, that if you are, if you hold on, if you don't recognize your story, that story is motivating you in ways that you don't have power over. And mm-hmm. I think that the end of season four is showing Silver as someone who actually doesn't have power. He still can manipulate things. He's still good at manipulation, but the power over his motivations is not in his hands. I think that his trauma, whatever it is, right, is, is motivating him without him taking control of the reins. Yeah. And I think you know that I agree with you. I think I said something yeah. similar on 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 our finale episode. Right. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely talked about this quite a bit. I I believe this more as time goes on. The more I now look at past seasons, I feel like this was. And in the beginning of this very episode, somebody in our roundtable talked about about silver being reactive. I mean, I think this relates mm-hmm. to that. The silver that silver is reactive. I think that silver's greatest motivation is human contact, even, Mm -hmm. and that's why he was so insistent. You know, he would like protested too much about not needing that thing in the beginning because it was the thing he most needed. But I don't think that he actually has control over that. I think it controls him. And that's actually, um, to go back to what Alistair said before about Eleanor, um, Alistair, I don't know if this is the same for you, but for me, the reason why Eleanor's story did not sit well with me at all was that from the very moment Woods Rogers enters her narrative, 
it is in his hands. Because remember, he says, uh, mm -hmm. he's talking about how everyone wants power to say, I was the one, one who hung Eleanor Guthrie. Um, he says, I want to say, I was the one who freed her. And ever since he says that, mm. her story is in his hands, yeah. right up until her very death, because he is the instrument of her death. Um, and so from the beginning of season three, Eleanor's story is no longer really her own, and it is in mm -hmm. his hands, um, both um, on her level and narratively. Um, and that's why that didn't really sit well with me, because she yeah. has kind of no agency, even though she thinks she does have agency. Um, was that why her story didn't sit well with you, or was it for a different reason? Yeah, no. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, I think that you're entirely right. And I think that there's an interesting deconstruction to be done of Eleanor's narrative through the whole series. Eleanor as the narrative property of Max. Eleanor as the narrative property of Charles Vane. Eleanor almost as the narrative property of Nassau, that she is... Oh. A, a product of the story of this place or or is at least bounded and constrained by the story of this place, I think is a really interesting perspective on Eleanor's character. But you're absolutely right. The way that Woods Rogers swallows her story, the way that he subverts her story and twists it to his own purpose, which is, you know, as I've hinted before, I think a purpose with which I am not entirely sympathetic, you guys. Um, that is a big part of my problem with their relationship is simply that she loses, as you say, all agency, mm -hmm. all presence in her own unfold narrative so yeah yeah so eleanor's inability to control her narrative is fascinating definitely i'm really interested in this idea of of silver being constrained by the refusal to disclose or the refusal to share or the refusal to wield his own narrative and i feel as though black sales as a text gives us counterpoint examples to that because it feels as mm -hmm. though flint is following the death of miranda flint is liberated by his ability to share his story. I'm, I'm thinking, of course, about him telling the story to Silver. But exactly. This is a moment of enormous power that mm -hmm. sharing this thing, which was thought shameful, was thought certainly definitive of Flint, is actually a moment of profound liberation for him. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And a thing that at the, I mean, for me, it was really interesting because at the end, I mean, I'm, I'm totally on the record for thinking that that was super dangerous for Flint and everyone kind of, didn't agree with me on how much mm -hmm. that was going to make Silver have more power over Flint mm -hmm. and be dangerous to Flint. And and it actually didn't turn out that way. Like it no. actually, it was the opposite, right? So Flint sharing his story, yes, it did give, it did give Silver power. It gave Silver power, though, like we said earlier in this episode, that, that Flint afforded him. It gave him power because Flint cared about him. Um, but it didn't, it didn't unempower Flint, the opposite, mm -hmm. because Flint, I mean, I would argue that in season four, Flint had done that thing, the thing I always wanted of all the characters. He had actually learned to be motivated by things, perhaps we could say reason and, 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 but he, he learned how to not be motivated against his will by his backstory. Mm -hmm. I and wonder Silver if a cannot escape his backstory yeah. if he doesn't allow the backstory to be something he takes a hold of. I wonder if there's simply a perspective on on greatness, on on a kind of twisted, you know, classical heroism in the sense that that if you are simply big enough, if you simply have enough motive force behind you, then you are liberated from the constraint of story that Flint can tell his story and not be destroyed by it because he's already Flint <laughs> that, you know, right. that he's somehow transcended the, the bounds of narrative in that sense. Is, is there an idea here that Flint can share this because his story can no longer touch him because Flint as distinct from McGraw mm -hmm. is now mythical is now archetypal is now mm -hmm. untouchable. In a way that Silver never is, because Silver finds, in part, his strength from the personal connection. And the story of Long John Silver is being built as it goes, whereas Flint mm -hmm. was already constructed before this narrative began. Oh, Lauren, that's very good. Yes, yes. Right, but the story of Long John Silver is a story, is not a backstory. That's a constructed story. I mean, in a way, maybe Silver's, no, Flint also has that, because the whole idea of the name of Flint. But yeah. that is that is a very different category of storytelling and storytelling in relation to personality than a backstory is. Well, it's the backstory for who Silver will be in Treasure Island. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, that's true, but we're not but we're not actually talking about <laughs> Treasure Island. When we're talking about what motivates, when we're talking about what I mean, we can have that's a different conversation to have when, you know, someday when we discuss Treasure Island, we can talk about that. But when we're talking about what motivates Silver right now in, you know, especially season mm-hmm. 4, but throughout the whole four seasons, we're talking about his the backstory, the one we don't know because mm-hmm. he won't tell it how it motivates him and then there's the story he's kind of he and flint maybe they're the they're the two characters that have two stories Mm -hmm. they have the backstory and how that affects them and they have the constructed adult story the 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 within black sales world story and how that affects them but what i'm talking about here is the backstory thing which which flint is freed Flint, like almost all the characters, are freed to some extent by coming to terms with theirs. Mm-hmm. Silver refuses to do that. Hmm. No, and you're very different... right that Flint and Silver occupy the space where they are both backstory, whether disclosed or not, mm-hmm. and also the legend. Constructed they are also story, created right. and constructed mm-hmm. in that right. sense. That's really interesting because that suggests an opposition, an intentional opposition with Woods Rogers, who has himself constructed his own legend through the writing of his book. Yes. So that's actually an interesting threesome then. Okay, so we have Woods Rogers who constructed his own current story, his legend. Okay, that's, let's, yeah, let's call them backstory and legend. That's a really great way to divide them. Yeah. Okay, so, and I would say that for Woods Rogers, the backstory thing is is losing his brother and that whole story. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the story that is the story that motivates him sometimes against his will, I would say. That's the foundational um, trauma that you were referring to exactly, earlier. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So for him, it's that. Um, so Woods Rogers has constructed his legend. Mm-hmm. You know, we could. that's a different discussion about like how effectively and what that means. Flint also thinks he constructed it. Mm-hmm. Silver had it constructed for him, and he never... I think there was a point where he almost wants to take control of that, but then mm-hmm. that... Oh, that's it. That's the difference is that the two of them constructed it because they understand their backstory and are willing to tell their backstory. Mm -hmm. Silver never manages to take control of his legend because he never he never came to terms with his backstory on any level. Hmm. Silver's backstory is presented around him. He's super uncomfortable with it. Like most of season four is him Mm -hmm. trying to say, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm that guy. I am Long John Silver. I will be your king. And then him going, oh, shit, I really don't like this. And then, you know, in that room with hands being really, really conflicted about it. Yeah. And then he and then he's like, "Uh -uh, I don't want this thing. I don't want this thing. I'll like this. This thing doesn't work for me at all. And yeah. maybe it's because he still is the power over him is the power of the backstory that he hasn't dealt with. I think there's something there. Absolutely. I think that we're, we're kind of conflating the the coming to terms with one's own history and the sharing of one's own history that, that functionally within the frame of this narrative, those two those two capabilities are, are somewhat conflated. But I think that to the extent that that is untrue psychologically, I think that is absolutely true in literary terms. I think that right. that yeah. we disclose and thereby come to terms with. Right. Well, that at least starts the process. I mean, I feel mm-hmm. like each character each character discloses their backstory in a different yeah. way. Yeah. Um, Flint has huh. it disclosed to us before he discloses it, um, but oh, each yeah, one then has point. their process that's... of working through it. But like, uh, was it right? It was. Toby, who said that, like, Jack, when he tells his backstory, like, this is something he was in the, he was used to telling it. He wasn't yeah. ashamed. There was no shame involved with his. Like, so each one had kind of a different relationship when we see them telling it mm-hmm. to their backstory. Like, And that's challenging for us to remember as we're watching the show, because we have to remember that the first time Flint tells his story is to Silver. Right. Because we get it disclosed to us. Right. But that's exactly. all of- you know, challenging the the linear frame of the narrative, at least. But I, th- I think well, that's really interesting. Wow, Daphne. and the interesting <laughs> and the interesting thing with those two in particular, like we see Max go through a process, we see Jack kind of go through. I mean, I don't think Jack actually does get to the end of that process, um, which is fine. I mean, for Jack, and, and I think where Jack Jack's is, that's odd because we come in late to his kind right, of right. to terms with his internal. Right, he had anyway. been telling yeah, yeah, this story. Yeah. Right, 
Flint and Silver are the two people who don't really have a process because it's mm-hmm. almost like Flint tells his story and that solves it. Well, because Flint's... his backstory is about shame. So yeah. telling the story loses well, Miranda, which is I right. think No, no, of course. No, but I'm trigger. talking about his internal, his internal in his in eternal growth, the telling of uh-huh. the story is actually the solution. That is the point where he it certainly is, he but I'm not I'm not sure that it is Flint's engagement with his own narrative that prevents him from telling that story earlier. I think it is the presence of Miranda in his life. We get this whole oh, dream sequence sure, perspective sure. on that, where, right. wherein it is asserted that Miranda, to some extent, birthed him, that Miranda, to some right. extent, created Flint, even by proxy. And it right. is the death of Miranda that liberates him to, yeah, that's to true. share that story and to begin the reintegration of Flint and James McGraw. Which I think is what makes Flint so powerfully dangerous through the third and fourth seasons. Right. Yeah, so you're exactly. saying that season three is his process. That's true. The process happens and the end of it is the telling of the story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you can't tell a story until it's over. Oh, right. Like right. there's, uh, oh, I, yes. this feels like this is just a sea uh, that the creators have made that I'm just a wash. Like yeah. I'm a drift in and people are like, <laughs> do you need help? And I'm like, I think I'm okay. Um, because everyone tells like if you ask someone what is the story of how you became you if you can't tell it then you're probably not done becoming you're probably in it yeah Mm -hmm. sure yeah Mm -hmm. and and and's is matter of fact you know and and right then we we kind of see her come to a crisis of thinking that's who i was that's not who I am, or or even that's not who I'm going to be, almost right. Because she's right. faced with that, it's thrust on her that she's a new identity. But Flint, yeah, it tells his story like it happened to another person, which is probably the way that a healthy person would, because you just mm-hmm. internalized it. Well, um, it it, ha- it happened to McGraw. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, every kind of character tells who they were. Or sooner or later, or or with um, Charles, I guess, doesn't, but Anne kind of knows, right? Because she says, you know, you don't know. Um, I just, I like, I, it's so interesting to me that it's not what the story is, it's that you know it. Mm-hmm. And that that's such an interesting, unexpected, because then we go into Silver and we want to know, but what's the story? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, mm-hmm. yeah, and I'm... I'm <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I'm of the mind that he, Flint, like, deceives, you know, in his story. He says, you know, it's not as interesting as I, I hang out with a Puritan woman who loves books. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> he implies that the truth is not interesting as the legend, but he's being deceitful because that's not the truth either. Right, um, right. But when Silver says, I, I don't, you know, that my story is just anyone else's, um, I get the impression that he believes it. Whether you believe that he is in that moment being honest or that memory is how he's remembering it, that is him justifying himself. And it is how it's delivered to me that, you know, no one was telling the story, so the story doesn't matter. That if if he believes that, then it doesn't matter what happened to him mm-hmm. because he's not done becoming who he's going to be. And then the end of the show is him choosing in a very active way, the identity that I'm going to take for myself. And now this will be the end of my origin story. And then it literally is the end of the origin story. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like this is the one part of it that because this story is about stories mm-hmm. that when you start asking about the power of a story, it's everything and nothing in a way. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Right. The power is who's telling it, not how true it is. Right. A, sto- a story is true. A story is not true. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> What's also interesting uh, is that Silver contradicts himself within the span of that same scene because he says, oh, my story is really unimportant and uneventful. Mm -hmm. But then he also says, my story has taught me the world is a place of unending horrors. Yeah, right. Directly (laughs) contradictory things. Absolutely it is. I know. I just I just super want to stick. I super want to stick silver into a into a psychologist room and just be like, be like oh, wow, really? Do you? Are what, you sure? What? Yeah, I kind of do. Like, I just want to be like, so when you say horrors, <laughs> break that down for me. Well, and you know what? The, the most fascinating thing for me is, and I think I said this to you, Daphne, right as it happened. I like the idea that the one person in the story who isn't defined by 
what happened to them is the person who is kind of controlling what happens after this. But I don't know that who he is or where he came from, I, I don't think it is needed to color his decision. Like his decision at the end is so human. Right. And and, and is, is so universal in I am seeing what happens to traumatized people and that now what they want to do more than anything is inflict more trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, that whether he experienced it or not in his own life, I don't think is, is necessary for him to say, I don't think this should continue. I think that's, that's kind of fascinating because he can be a character in the story or a surrogate for us. Mm-hmm. Right. And both are completely validated by what's actually in there. Exactly. No, you're totally right about that. And, and I think there's two points about that in terms of silver is that I think that silver doesn't understand. He's not seeing Flint at the end. He's not understanding who Flint is. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of argument for that within the text. And yes, he is right. I mean, this gets to the political thing about revolution is that is that he is kind of all of us. He is the mm-hmm. person who's like, yeah, your ideals are really cool. But like, ultimately, I just want to protect my house. Like, <laughs> yes, I, you know, like I will tweet about my politics, but I don't actually want to put anything on the line mm-hmm. for it. Sure. Um, right. He's definitely that guy. And that definitely is most of us. I mean, that is that is. Fair. And and I think I've me I've definitely said this to Lauren. I've definitely said this to uh, one of our listeners who I've talked to a lot about this stuff. Like, I think it's so telling that that Flint's pretty effective when fighting England, and yet the person mm-hmm. who brings him down is that guy. Is that guy mm-hmm. who's like, well, actually, I really yeah, don't but... want my, my, I really don't want my like fiance to die or my wife or whatever we're gonna call her, mm-hmm. like. That that the power the power that brings down the revolutionary is not the empire. Oh, it's the conference of domesticity, right? Charles exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It oh. is. It's right. It's exactly what Charles says. That that the you know give us give us your freedom and we'll give you the comfort you need. That that is actually the most dangerous thing of all. And what's maybe most provocative when we're thinking about Silver's interaction with his own backstory is the scene in the finale where he encounters his previous self, where he encounters right. the, the cook. Yes, yes, the car yeah. the cook, uh-huh. And he is so completely changed that in the first instance, he doesn't even recognize this guy. And I think that Silver's discontinuity of experience, here his discontinuity of personality mm-hmm. almost, is unique. In black sales, I don't think anyone else has had that kind of fundamental break. Has had that kind right. of has so thoroughly become someone else. Even McGraw and Flint would recognize each other in a bar. Mm-hmm. You know, they, yep. they would, oh, it's you. Hey, long time no see. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> pretty, pr- pretty okay, good. Okay, see now that's this is actually one of my questions. I'm going to now bring this to one of my other questions because I actually argue the opposite. I oh, think that that scene. Remember Silver in in episode one. Mm-hmm. He's not cowering. That is I true. think that that parallel exists for us to see that Silver, yes, it's suggesting. It's a fun callback when you first look at it because you think Silver's seeing his former self. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. But he's not. Silver was not cowering. Silver right. was not cry- or at, what on the verge of tears. He was yeah. not afraid. He, he always just, had a plan, was always right. He yeah. was in the middle Ooh. of a he was in the middle of a con when he when we first see him. Well, he I mean, saw something actually, valuable. We don't know where he was or what he was doing. Right. Well, there's that. Yeah. But he saw that thing. He saw the schedule. He grabbed yep. it. He's not cowering. He raises his hands in pseudo coward cowardice mm-hmm. and says, I'm a very good cook. So one, he's lying. Mm-hmm. Two, he's not cowering. Three, he's already formulating a plan. Right. So in the external, though, it's a callback to the mm-hmm. episode one of season one. But when you really look at it, what you see is the difference. This goes to my question of how much. And I've got to thank, wait, thanking the listener, Artie the Aqua Boy, a.k.a. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, for Artie the Aqua Boy's pirate name, Larry Lucifer. This is what Artie, Artie the Aqua Boy, uh, Artie the Aqua Boy asked this question in a in a Twitter conversation: Has Silver actually changed? 
Like, I've gone on and on. I am so on the mm-hmm. record going, oh, my God, this man has changed so much. Yes. And I love this. And this arc is phenomenal. Has he actually? Once we see the whole story, mm-hmm. is Silver actually that different? Oh. Like, I mean, I again, I just in this episode talked about how amazing it is in mm-hmm. season two to watch him. I think what we're watching in season two, now that I've looked back from from the end of season four i think what we're seeing in season two is him actually accepting this thing he has of needing community mm-hmm. but i don't you know and luke but said then, specifically that he was pretending to be a coward like i don't think yeah. he was ever a coward i think he always needed community he was just protesting too much mm-hmm. but then finally sure. gave in and mm-hmm. that was the thing that motivated him to the end i don't think silver actually is that different he just See, looks it I would argue that he's fundamentally different. I would argue that he's okay. as different as different can be because I think mm-hmm. I, I do agree that that he was never a coward. Uh, what mm-hmm. a gift it is to be underestimated. I think that he yep. played into exactly. that sense of himself in the eyes of others, and that was a survival tactic. But what we see from my perspective, at least of Silver's story through the entire arc of the series, is first that engagement with community, then mm-hmm. that leadership potential that mm-hmm. begins with you know the stamping which begins with this right. this yep. popularity almost that he rises to a position of leadership and then thereafter into a position of something approaching legend something approaching you know myth at that point but then ultimately rejects it all he ultimately loses all of that and we can argue whether or not that was the right choice a compelling choice a good choice but we can i think see in the finale, in the, in the closing moments of the finale, Silver stepping away from really the apotheosis of everything that he sought, because he would have been free. He would have been able to set his own course and, and, and track his own destiny. But instead, he steps back, steps down, and becomes focused on an individual. He becomes focused on someone else. See, I'm going to argue yeah. that the <laughs> situation has changed throughout. Mm-hmm. But his essence is not. So, so what is his essence in this regard? His essence is whatever his trauma was and a need for human connection. And that's hmm. it. And I'm going to Ooh. now credit Andrew. We have two screenshots, which I will now do use again. <laughs> I placed one. Andrew found the second one. Um, I'm just going to describe them to you all, but hopefully you'll remember what I'm talking about. So we have in the beginning of season four, when silver walks away from Flint, making a decision at the gate of betrayal. And we have that image that they used in all the promotional materials of him in that doorway. Right. And he is going over a threshold through a birthing canal. However, we want to use the imagery because Uh he has lost connection to a person. And then Andrew found the second image, which is him talking to Maddie in 410. Oh, and in the you mirror. see him in that mirror yeah. where the composition is exactly the same. Mm-hmm. And I think that what we're seeing here is that the ultimate thing for Silver is that he always needed the personal connection. He pretended in the beginning, just like he pretended to be a coward, mm-hmm. that he didn't need it. But this is all that has ever motivated him. And that oh. I see him turning away from the power that's offered him because that is actually the side of him that was true in season one was that he never wanted the larger goal. He pretended Mm -hmm. to need to want the larger goal because that afforded him a a connection with Flint, but that that was never who he was. He was never trying to be King. That was, that was imposed on him by Billy. He was always the person who wanted the pot of gold the safety, because the pot of gold, he never wanted it for itself. We understand that because he turned away from it the minute Flint said, where else would you matter? Mm-hmm. But mattering for Flint is a large thing, a like world saving thing, right, sure. a leadership thing. Mattering for Silver is about human connection. Right. So he would trade the whole crew for Maddie because Maddie was the strongest human connection he had. Yep. He had exactly. made so far. So it was worth right. even that risk. Exactly. That's interesting. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Him, him coming upon that cook, it definitely invites the question of remember when he was just pretending to be that. Is he just pretending now? But it's interesting when you ask, is he is he different? Because I picture him in that clearing with Flint, 
and he is so profoundly a different person than when I met him, I think. Well, he learned. He's different because time passes and people learn, but I think his yeah. essence is actually the same. Well, yeah, because then I picture him in that scene with Maddie, and he is more himself than that he used to be than at any point leading up to that. Like, the, the story he tells her with all of his affectation, I mean, it, it reads to me like the very first story he told. Mm -hmm. um, which is which is so unsettling to me <laughs> because it's almost <laughs> it's like it's like a person who was on the path to do something better and then they missed the point and it's almost like well where do you end up now then because you didn't become what that mm -hmm. point was supposed to make you 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 kind of co-opted it for your own goal mm -hmm. well and we, we know where he ends up yeah, it's, it's also hard to, because he really, he wasn't choosing that life for Maddie. He was choosing it because he wanted her, uh, which makes it his choice, not hers. And it wasn't a sacrifice. Oh, man. Why did you have to do that? Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it could have been, he's just back. Oh, why'd he her. have to do this? That's nothing to do with me. <laughs> no, no. Why did you have to put that in my head? Oh, see, this is what Alistair did with me about the teacup. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I think that's a really, really interesting question is because Flint is so profoundly changed and his, like the it's ending. It's Larry story. Lucifer. It's Larry Lucifer. We blame him. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, unless, unless you take it that the ending of the show is exactly as it's presented, in which case Flint didn't really change it all either. Because Flint's back to being who he was. <laughs> right, Daphne? Right. Right, because that's right? possible. Because you can make all those choices and wear someone like Flint with all that violence and all that difficulty, and then just like shed him like a jacket. Yeah, mm -hmm. take him off. Yeah, <laughs> throw, throw him back in. The shed him like a magnificent captain's coat. <laughs> yeah, give him some rum and have him sink back into the sea. Yeah. Well, yeah, the ridiculousness of that idea that Silver presents that is not how humans work um, right. goes back to I think. <laughs> I think that um, Silver is the same in his essence, but he's become, somewhere along the way, he got lost among all the storytelling that he was surrounded right. with. And he kind of got lost in his own ability for conning and storytelling, and he mm -hmm. kind of conned himself. <gasps> oh, I love I that. Like that. Yeah. He definitely conned us, and he conned himself, kind wow. of like Flint kind of messed himself up with his own ideas of how stories could affect him. Yeah, when you start telling your own story. <gasps> oh, goodness. Hmm. Oh, Lauren. So, like, Silver's I like relationship that. with... Silver that is a whole other episode right there. <laughs> <laughs> Just in that idea. It's like I'm saying everything anyone <laughs> says could become an episode. <laughs> wow. Silver's essence hasn't changed, but his relationship with how he sees the world definitely has fundamentally right. changed. Mm -hmm. Right. And so has. Oh, wow. Right. Lauren and I were just having a conversation. Mm -hmm. Sorry. There's just like everyone's I'm referencing my not outside of podcast ref <laughs> conversations with everyone. Lauren and I were just were having a conversation about Flint and about the idea that he had um, that he expresses in season two um, to Miranda about the idea that he could just like wear Flint. Right. And then cast him off again. Like that's why he even chose that name. And does, you know, do humans work that way, especially mm -hmm. when with the experiences and the choices he made as someone like Flint. So the idea that Silver's telling the story that Flint went back to his original McGraw self mm -hmm. is absurd because we don't do that. It doesn't work right. that way. Right. We don't. Well, we don't. Okay. Human beings don't. But then human beings in real life don't do a lot of things that characters in Black Sails do. Uh... See, I'm going to argue that one. I agree with you about, and we're about to get to the mythological question, but I agree with you that, that Black Sails is very mythological, and at the same time, I don't think it ever actually leaves humanity. And that's what's truly well, sure. amazing about it, mm -hmm. that you, if you just went mythological with everything, that's mm -hmm. a neat story, and that's a neat gimmick, and that's really fun for people who know about mythology or want to research about mythology, but that the truly amazing thing about Black Sails is that it manages to do that and mm -hmm. still say, stay true to humanity at the same time. Mm, to a certain yeah, extent. Yeah, that's what makes the show yeah. so compelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're not, like, you can't walk down the street and 
uh, see Jack Rack. Well, actually, I live in Brooklyn, so I do walk down the street. Yeah, you and totally see Jack, Jack Rack. <laughs> 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 well okay but these black characters might not be in the real world but yeah their fundamental traits mm -hmm. definitely are very human which is why the show resonates with so many people mm -hmm. they might not behead people and do all these crazy things but if that was all the show was we wouldn't be talking about the show in this way mm -hmm. it's their it's their humanness that makes them right. leap off the screen yeah Right. I have had a series of amazing conversations with one of our listeners named Kate, who is a his is an anthropologist of that period, um, oh. primarily of Spanish colonies. But she has been sending us a series of emails talking about how much so much of this is actually really, really, really true to that period. It's amazing. Um, I, yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna have to figure out a way to share some composite of her emails, but we've been talking mm -hmm. about Max a lot and talking about pirates and she's teaching about pirates in university. And, um, this is really manages to be super mythological and also based in a lot of realism at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But Al so yeah, maybe it's time for us to segue into Alistair's Alistair's point <laughs> about this is just going great. This is perfect. Um, so shift to the Ms. Alistair's question was the shift to the mythic tone in season four. I think you know I I would argue definitely that that's throughout, and I think season three has a whole lot of that too. But let mm -hmm. tell us yeah, your thoughts yeah. about that, and then we'll all discuss. I think that that Black Sail's tone escalates throughout its run, that we start off season one with the exception of, you know, the cold open of the first episode, which is deliberately mythic and, and, and deliberately almost uh, symbolic in its use of, mm -hmm. of pirate archetype and, and, and pirate, you know, um, convention. Right. But after that, we, we subvert expectations by moving into what is a fairly low-key, a fairly naturalistic depiction of the life of these characters. Mm -hmm. As the show continues through its entire run, we we escalate and escalate and escalate. We ra we raise the tone, we raise the the level of rhetoric until by the time we hit season four, we're entering a story in which space and time have all but collapsed. There's no sense of how long it takes these events to happen. There's no sense of how long it takes to travel to you know the colonies, for example, and that's completely fine because throughout Black Sails there is a sense of of Nassau as a place of myth, as a place mm -hmm. of wonder. It's it's not really a part of the real world. It's not really historical fiction. It's only historical fiction in the broadest strokes. Mm -hmm. Instead, we get a, a broadly mythological take on pirates exclamation point which is great and is exactly what the show should have done by the time we hit season four it has become so mythological that we have so so grandiose in its in its scale and in its intensity so operatic mm. that my fear is that in season four we lose some of the ground level incidental characters that we've sure. connected with over the course mm -hmm. of the series i think the perfect example of this is the maroon queen who right. just disappears from the narrative completely. She is fantastic and engaging and absolutely a part of the realpolitik of season three. We move into season four and she's gone because there's no mm -hmm. space for her. Mm -hmm. Arguably, I think even Featherstone and Adele, but for their final, you know, their, the resolution of their story, which belongs to the Rackham epilogue, sure. which kind right. of resets us back down into a more naturalistic tone, we kind of lose track of them. I would argue that Anne in, in large, well. yeah, exactly. I was going to say, I think everything in Philadelphia yes. feels. Anne and Max are all but lost in the mm -hmm. shuffle at this mm -hmm. point because that's not the story we're telling. So right. I wondered what you guys made of this move toward a more mythological tone. If you if you can see that within the text of the story, and if you felt that, well, obviously it delivers a devastating climax. Well, obviously the the mythological tone of you know the last arc of Black Sails is rich and grandiose and, and bombastic. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the show somehow, or, or to some extent, betrays the naturalism of its origins by leaving behind these characters that we've identified so much with? I don't Who think it betrays it, but that's precisely the reason that season four is not my favorite season, and season mm -hmm. two is, because season two is the one that is most right. rooted in this naturalism and where the characters are mm -hmm. at their most human. Um, I think season four needed to do that because I, th I think this show was inevitably heading towards 
this mythological status and it needed to go there. I kind of wish characters like Anne hadn't faded from the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, but yeah, I, I think that it, because this is mixing history with Treasure Island, there was always going to be an inevitable clash of these things. Right, right. Mythological, and I, yeah, I don't know if the show could have done it in any other way. Although I would like for have and to have had more screen time. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> um, well, and I think Anne yeah, fits so well into that mythological space too. And it's a shame that she was sidelined to Philadelphia with those characters that were uh, on, on the, the human side, uh, on the mortal side of things. Mm -hmm. So on the mortal um, side. <laughs> yes. Well, because Max and right. Jack sure, were sure. always mortals, you know. But right. Flips Absolutely. Over, and and I would argue Anne had that kind of. Um, well, and Maddie, I think Maddie, yeah. I think Maddie fits also in that in that role yeah. as well. Well, well. Which one? In the mythological, in the mythological, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Andrew, do you have thoughts? I uh, do. I have thoughts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you met me. Hi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, my first thought is that the the show kind of rises to the text or, or the the subject matter is dealing with. Like the scenes in the maroon camp are kind of chilling and and terrifying or dangerous in a way that mm -hmm. the rest of the show usually doesn't feel and as soon as they move into, you know, this space of this is big stuff, gang. Like, this is, we are dealing with the like, root of humanity and the heart of darkness level, uh, you know, you know, kind of messages and immortal subjects and themes. It felt like the scale of the show rose to meet it. Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I guess I kind of happened slowly because I never realized at what point it takes over. But when they moved to the island and it was, you know, talking about the the ghosts and yes. the voices, yeah. and it was kind of like, I guess we're here. Yeah, this makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but it was this kind uncharted of uncharted island that that does not belong alongside the real world. Yeah. Yeah, and I, it, maybe in hindsight, that is kind of a you could say that it's part of Jack's you know, account that when you get to this part of the story, the fiction takes over because what happens from here on out is kind of either fantastic in human scale mm -hmm. or depending on how you read the show presenting the facts, it is fantasy in, in a different kind of way. Uh, I'm kind of drawn to stories that embrace a mythic level to the, the kind of human ideas. And I guess that's kind of, I mentioned that earlier when it felt like the end of season three and four were rising to the scale of, we are talking about what it means to be human. Uh, it only made sense. The show went up that ramp with it saying, yep. And this is as epic. This is the definition of what myth is about. Uh, and we are going to make these characters mythic. I guess it kind of speaks to how strongly they were characterized that they still felt familiar because this could have right. gone a different way where it becomes like, you know, green screen extravaganza. And sure, we are absolutely uh, something you're yeah, watching yeah, 300. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and um, yeah. For me, the, the, the mythic only supports the human mm -hmm. of them. I think that's I mean, true. For me, it really, myth, though, isn't it? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think in this case, um, again, you know, I think, you know, I guess I've never said this explicitly, but I feel like, you know, my obvious orientation towards discussing character has always been more psychological as much as I love myths and I will definitely mm -hmm. reference them. But I do feel like I, I really feel like the mythic nature of all of the seasons, including season four, really supports the this, the discussion of them as humans, the humanity of them. And I think it is easy for a story mm -hmm. to lose sight of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. when you when you go just into archetype, as much as I adore archetype as a way to discuss black sales or all stories, mm -hmm. it's very easy to go into archetype and lose yeah. the humanity of a character. You do, but in that but if you do, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Right. That's what I'm saying. They're totally you know, yeah. doing it. No, no. So I, and I obviously I think Black Sales is doing it right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because I am mm. our Captain Flint of this round table. And they can't do what I can do. I am going to now make this group of people answer with one word. 
because we've been going so long, I'm going to make everyone answer with one word a question that, for real, we could go on for another hour about. But no, <laughs> you each get one word. Okay. Who loves the best? Elizabeth. Miranda. Alistair. No, you don't get to argue with her. You don't get to argue with no, her. No, you no, get that one wasn't word. arguing. That was very good. That was a very good answer. <laughs> Um, who you can say the, the same best? word. You can say the same word, but you have to say one. You get one word. Max, I love you for that. Okay, <laughs> Lauren, Jack, can I do, use a line to accompany my word? Fine, because you're Lauren Sarner, you can go. <laughs> you line, darling. You know all I've ever wanted is for you to be happy. Oh, oh my heart yeah. is broken. I love Mike it. Mike okay. that line. <laughs> Andrew. Teach. Oh, teach. I like with all that his answer. wives. I like that too. <laughs> I like that answer. And with Vane. Okay. Oh, shit. I don't know my answer. You have to answer. <laughs> You're cute, Daphne. Oh, I forgot that I have to actually answer my own question. Mm -hmm. Max. Mm -hmm. I'm with Alistair. You and me, Daphne. Internet high five. Absolutely. <laughs> Internet high five. <laughs> in our adoration of Max. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Alistair, again, thank you for this totally insane idea that turned out way less chaotic than I thought it would be. This well, was, yeah. Because you are a ruthless taskmaster is why. Yeah. <laughs> again, you will be our do Charles what I can do. <laughs> I, I could be your Charles Vane. No, she's just Absolutely. all of them. She's gotten every character all now. Way to go. I, I am the embodiment of all of the pirates. You are all and the non pirates. pirates. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, um, let's quickly, everyone, I'm going to say your names and tell me where people can find you and what you're up to these days. Okay. Let's start with Andrew. Andrew, where can we find you and what are you up to these days? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Andrew B D Y C E. Uh, I am, as always, writing about movie and TV stuff happenings at ScreenRant.com. Uh, and everything I do or complain about or wax poetic can be found on Twitter. So that's probably the best place to find me. <laughs> Fair enough. Excellent. Lauren. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Lauren Sarner. That's S-A-R-N-E-R. -E Still writing for Inverse. Um, I'm writing uh, also about mostly television. Um, going to be writing about American Gods, doing some <laughs> handmade detail writing, covering Game of Thrones. Uh, so, yes, Twitter is probably the best place. Mm -hmm. All right. Alistair Stevens. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Paper Bullets, or you can find me at PointNorthMedia.com, where I talk about stories a lot, like a lot. You guys, you don't have time to listen to all of it, I promise, but it's a lot. I do. First, I listen to all of it. Everything that Lauren and Andrew have written, and then you can come on over to Point North Media and listen to me talk about stuff. Talk about Tolkien and talk about American Gods and talk about Harry Potter at some point this summer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Elizabeth Stevens. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at LizbethRay555. I'm at Common Room Radio also, of course, commonroomradio.com, doing Disney Villain Deathmatch, uh, Porch Club with Liz and Sarah. And I will also be uh, with, with you, Daphne, and with you, Alistair, talking mm -hmm. American Gods starting here up shortly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I am at Daphne Olive on Twitter. And uh, also, we are not done with Fathoms Deep. So we're going to do lots of True. fun things. I think our next thing is our episode with John Steinberg. We are mm. super excited. Hi, John. Yes, we can't wait to good. talk to you. Um, so Fathoms Deep is not done. I'm also super excited to be with Elizabeth and with Alistair talking about American Gods. I get to be the person who doesn't know shit because I haven't <laughs> read it. Uh, so that's going to be super, super fun for me. I can't wait. Also, by the way, I really love Ian McShane. Uh, mm -hmm. And we should clarify that that is through Point North Media and uh, Storms on the Way. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, it is. Yes. So you can find that at Point North Media. It, it will. It is already on iTunes because Alistair is covering the book as well. 
Mm-hmm. Slowly, very slowly covering Slower. the book. I, I'm just, <laughs> I am the designated person to not listen to those. So that's kind of weird for me because I have never not listened to one of Alistair's podcasts. So it's really <laughs> weird for me. Um, but I am showing some amount of restraint and for also sure. just riding on my love. Wait, did I say that? That I actually really love me and McShane? Uh, you, Lauren, you mentioned it? You did say that. I think you could. I recently looked oh, into his that. eyes and shook his hand, and I, I messaged know! Daphne right after. <laughs> <laughs> Daphne yes. was the first yeah. message. Oh, Lord. So, yes. Wow. Follow Lauren wow. and keep an eye out on life. Inverse because there's <laughs> going to be stuff about when she actually met Ian McShane. I, Pretty good. Pretty good. Oh, my goodness. I know. I love that man. Yes. Everyone should just go, like, in addition to watching American Gods, just also. Why not go watch Deadwood? It's amazing, and I should do that. Oh yes, you should, Liz. Oh, okay, my goodness. Okay, I I love Deadwood a lot, and that's when I fell in love with Ian McShane, and this mm-hmm. has been a love affair that has been going have on you, for many years. Have you not mentioned that he plays a pirate in the fourth Pirates movie? Mm-hmm. Oh right! Oh, that's true. <laughs> I have not. He's Blackbeard, isn't he? Yeah, he does Blackbeard. Uh, is he? Oh my goodness! I've only it's. I know people don't don't hate me for this. I've only seen one Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, talking about like what Pirates movie? Uh, uh, there's there's kind of only one that's worth seeing. Uh, uh-huh. Agreed. I was like, then they just kept making them because money. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Don't the rest. The first is great. The rest just don't even watch them. Um, so I thought, although yeah. I kind of have to because I did say, I think I just said on Twitter that I will watch anything that Ian McShane's in and that is true there's a movie that I adore that I can't think of the name of I mean he's been in many movies but there's one I particularly adore that's like a crime movie I don't mm. know Ian McShane mm-hmm. I just really love that guy <laughs> it's really it's kind of absurd my yeah sorry Alistair and Liz be prepared I already don't worry said about it. that we're very prepared yeah, I'm just going to have to talk about my love a lot. It's going to be very good. Enough. It is it is deep and strong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone. Uh we're going to let Alistair and Lauren and Andrew go and Liz and I will continue with pirate names you all have been waiting a really long time Ooh. and we are ready to do that thing now. So, thank you very much everyone. Thank you for listening to Fathoms Deep. Thank you Alistair and Lauren and Andrew for joining us. This was so much fun. Oh, you're very Thank welcome. You. It was a pleasure. Anytime. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks again. Until next time from Common Room Radio, I'm Elizabeth Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. And now we'll do pirate names. Ready to guns. Full compliment. All right, Daphne. So who are we naming this week? Who gets a ship? Who gets a pirate name? Who gets a promotion? It's the last time. Oh, God. I know. It's the last time we're doing this. And uh, as, I guess, a celebration of that, we have so many people. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Let's go then. So many. And also, I just want to preface this by saying, guys, if I if I missed you. We like, missed you. There were so many. Yes. Just tell us. Just tweet at us. And yep. we will... We will do that in our next episode. We'll hook you up. And, yeah. And we love you all. And this has been so much fun playing these games. <laughs> it really has. <laughs> all righty. So our very first person is at Scorpion80. Scorpion, Scorpion Pierce. Scorpion Pierce. Fantastic. Okay. So that's got to be a ship, Who, right? She's got plenty of promotions. That has got to be a ship. Yes. So would you like me to read you her ship name? I would. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what she's got in her fleet. All right, she has the Isis, the Osiris, the Nefertiti, the, <laughs> the Labaskachne. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, Craig, Which I hope, you dear I hopefully... sweet boy. <laughs> Craig, we love you if you're listening. Oh, my and, God, that was so much I, fun. Please don't cringe at how I just pronounced yeah, that. I did my best. I don't know. All right, what should we give our darling? Uh, okay, so we're back to Egypt, I guess, right? Uh, so uh, yes, we we did a little detour sure. to the very southern part of Africa, and we can go back <laughs> up to Egypt now. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, um, what about? Oh, I don't know the papyrus. Does that sound good? That sounds. Great. I think that's fun. Yeah, there you go, my dear. All right, and next we have the Odyssey. Celian Cersei. Now. Uh, 
the Odyssey, at the Odyssey, Sally and Cersei, I, I have this memory of you telling us we skipped you, so I didn't know if we you get one thing or two this time. So let's give her we, two. It's the last time. Let's, okay, Bonus. let's just give her two because that'll make her into a captain. So excellent, you Captain Ceylon are, Cersei. God, that's yep. sexy. I like it. Aye, aye, Captain. <laughs> She gets a ship. How about the Lady Grey? There you go. Perfect. Mm, That's I fabulous. like that very much. Good. So, okay. Next we have Trisha, who is at Mona Corey. Okay. Hi, Trisha. She gets a pirate name. She is in Topeka, Kansas, which interestingly enough, for me to get Topeka, I cross through the Flint Hills. Oh! <gasps> Mm-hmm. So maybe we can give her something with Flint, although, you know, we've got... Cap- mm. Yeah, so maybe, right. maybe we play with it just a little bit. Um, We can riff with that. So Flint and arrows and sparks and fire. Oh, right, sparks. Yeah, Spark is sparks good. Fire. Yeah. Maybe... Um, oh, maybe prairie fire. Oh, excellent. Not at all nautical, it's but It's not still nautical, cool. but I still like that. Yeah, yeah. All right. And yeah, I think we've... Been- bunch of new pirates yes we do we also have at burkish man burkish man burkish brackish brackish water at uh, ooh, maybe backwater uh, <laughs> okay backwater bur- birdie backwater bert what do you think daphne help me I riff like with it. me I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. Backwater Just, Bert. You like Bert? Backwater Bert. Yep. I like that. Yep. That's good. Okay. And the next is our friend Kim at Clower Cottage. Oh, my God. Else? All of the ships. She gets yes. Texas ships. I remember that. Okay. okay. Um, so... Should I read them to you or we just know it's Texas? Uh, I, I mean, sure, for the sake of it, let's just let everybody hear how many fucking ships she has because she's yep. just got an armada at her hands. Go ahead. Yep. She has the Lone Star, the Alamo, the Santa Ana, the Mesquite, the Yellow Rose, the Blue Bonnet, and her special ship named by Lisa is Red Velvet. <laughs> nice. Okay. <laughs> and her new ship is the Laredo. Perfect. All right. Our next pirate who gets a new ship is our dear friend Megan at Ithaca. At Ithaca. Dagger-eyed Fantastic. Dame. Yes. Dagger eyed dame. That's a, okay. Yeah. I like these pirate who names. Has, this was a good fun game. Fun this game. This is a really fun game. Um, I know. Seriously, Liz, you need to write a pirate book because you have all of the names already. <laughs> With heaving bosoms and ripping corsets and rapiers and <laughs> sails and hashtag adult feelings. Yes, write that other I'll kind get of pirate right story. On it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, at Ithaca, you have the cutlass, the rapier, the dirk, the broadsword, the bread knife. <laughs> Sorry, I giggled like that. I had port in my mouth. Okay, uh, uh-huh. the bread knife. Which, which is like kind of the least cool, but also kind of the coolest if you because sure like sales. Okay, so I was going to say the saber is this is a saber. Oh is yeah, that? saber is great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well done. All right, look at me naming things. Mm-hmm. Crazy. I'm very proud that of you, Daphne. Makes up for the bread knife, which was also <laughs> mine. <laughs> All right, next is at Quilly Wonk, who is Cougar Calypso. You are now a quartermaster. Cougar Calypso. I do not remember naming that. (laughs) Might have been a little tipsy. I like that, though. The Calypso part, especially. All right. And next is at Acorn Carla. Carla, Portuguese man of war. Yep. Okay. Let me see where. Oh, there she is. Mm -hmm. She has the Marilyn. She needs a new ship. Oh, of course. Okay. So, ah, I know I did that. Okay. So, and so her next one will be, oh, geez. Um, yeah, her next ship should be the Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. And next up is at Gypsy Book Nerd. I should have organized these alphabetically, but I did uh, not. She's Esmeralda Salt. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. And she has the Frollo, the Quasimodo. Oh, yes. And the Phoebus. Okay. Phoebus. All right. Well, since it's the last one, let's give her the Victor Hugo. Okay. There you go. (laughs) And at Emily Emerly, of course. Yes. Stormy Morley. (laughs) 
<laughs> Stormy Morley, who I think we can now declare is the winningest pirate captain ever. Uh-huh. I like that. Um, all right, dear. You have the Tempest, the Verona, the Ocracoke, the Hurricane, the Willing Mind, Queen Anne's Revenge, Battlestar, Adama, Cthulhu. All over the place. That's so funny. Orion, Libra. <laughs> okay, so now we're in uh, we're in galaxies and constellations, mm-hmm. huh? Uh, and mm-hmm. the Cassiopeia. All right, fabulous. Okay, and next at Lady Godiver who is Deep Dark Diver, you are now Quartermaster. Deep Dark Diver, Quartermaster. I like it. Very good. Congratulations. Okay, and now we have another new pirate. Oh, a new one. Okay. Yep, what have I got to work with? At Waterman Matt. Waterman Matt. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we just did a water one. We did backwater. So let's do um, Waterman Matt. Uh Oh, you know, we didn't say what our what the thesis was. <laughs> Just for anyone who's wondering, the thesis was a story is true, a story is not true. Right, of course. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> you know, I like Waterman so much. Let's just give him like Willie Waterman. Okay. I think that's good. All righty. Congratulations, Willie Waterman. Come yeah. aboard, sailor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and next is... At Lucky Lady, who is a quartermaster. Oh, so D, D. Yes. you are a quartermaster. And bonus, you know, you did just hear me promise you that Max episode I've been saying. Mm-hmm. And seems that I've got Liz and Alistair doing that with me. So did I agree to that? I was drinking some new whiskey. Uh, okay, well, no, I'm in. Alistair sure. did, but oh. I just assumed you wanted in on that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you not want to talk about that? Of Max? course I do. That yeah, no, impossible. I'm in. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Also, it's my show. Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, next is at Wine Dark Sales, Beatrix Bordeaux is now mm-hmm. a captain. Congratulations, Captain Beatrix Bordeaux. Oh, God. So we'll give her a ship called, um, ooh, let's see, the Beaujolais Nouveau. There you go. That's great. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next. New captain. New captain alert. Uh, at James Carson, I believe the third. I believe it's James Carson. I, I, I. <laughs> that seems right. Very appropriate. Um, so, yes. New, ca- new, new pirate. You mean new pirate name, not a captain. I, yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. I meant new pirate. Okay. I'm really tired. Fair We've enough. We've been talking a lot. Um, new pirate. <laughs> a lot of podcasting is, this week. Lots, yeah, lots of podcasting. podcasting. Yeah. At James Carson, possibly the third. James Carson. Or, 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 right. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was wow, the we're like, talking. We're getting like full on kitschy pirate we stories. Are, uh, now are. that Black Sails is done, it's like let's let's just go back to all those stereotypes. Oh <laughs> yes. So um James Carson is how about we give him a real badass one and he can be Jimmy the Keel Holler. Oh <laughs> we hope you like that. Yeah. Hurts it's- me in my soul. A little bit, a yes. little bit. Totally hauling. badass. Shit, that was bad. Yep. And <laughs> yeah, it was. And last but not least, unless we miss someone and we apologize and just tell us and we'll get you next time, is at Charlie eighteen seventy seven. Chumbucket Chum Charlie, Charlie. Uh, one of our first ever pirates. That's in right. These games. Got all the fish ships, right? Is that correct? Um, Undersea I creatures. So. The sea urchin, the marlin, the yes. hammerhead, the nautilus, the brittle star. The Great White and the Manta. Man, that is a lot. Yeah, Mm -hmm. gosh. Uh, Okay, so and the Orca? Does she have an Orca yet? She does not. The Orca. Let's do it. Yeah. There you go, Charlie. That's your last ship. Oh, thank you, everyone. This has been been such a blast. Mm Mm-hmm. It really, really, really has. We we love you all for playing our games with us. We really do. It has really been so much fun. Gosh. Yep. I'm going to miss this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll find some future podcasts with some future games we can play. Absolutely. Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. 
To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash common room radio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag Fathoms Deep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening. What, what whiskey do you have, Daphne? Oh, the Fag. Yes. Lovely. Yeah, I'm going super smoky today. Mm-hmm. Um, ah. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting it on those ones now. Yeah. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm getting oh, it on. Does that mean that, that one whiskey is not going to be waiting for me when I get there, huh? I forget which one it is. Oh, the salad oh, no, skirt? No, we finished There's the talisker. waiting for you, She was Daphne. a dirty mermaid, but we finished her. <laughs> she was a dirty girl. She did us wrong. <laughs> we will, we will God, buy some The next morning, she rifled through her pocket, stolen everything. My jewelry box was empty. God damn. I thought we were having such a good time. <laughs> now you all know why I strip layers. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> now you all know why we're starting a whiskey review podcast. That's right. Now, now you know what our outtake is. <laughs> <laughs>